We're live now, Mayor McQueen. Well, thank you, everyone, and good well. Or, start that again. Good, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our uh, council meeting of June 16, 2021. We're halfway through June already, and the summer is on its way. I want to welcome our council. I want to welcome our staff and also the viewing public that is uh, uh, watching us today and those that uh, will be watching us later at their leisure. Uh, we do have uh, an agenda that was published on our website and uh, there is an agenda there and uh, on item two, it's the approval of the agenda, but are there any things to add or delete from the agenda? Uh, go ahead, Councilor Nielsen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have two items that I wish to add to today's agenda because they are time sensitive. Uh, the first item is the um, Great Highlands Police Services Board recommendation regarding the joint board proposal. Uh, so that one's time sensitive because we've already actually inputted uh, our uh, Great Highlands statement. So this is just an addition to that. The second one is uh, from the Internet Infrastructure Task Force recommendation regarding a four by six mailer to the agenda under items for consideration, please. Okay, and uh, are you able to forward any of information? Because as we deal with added items, if it gets this, if this gets approved, are you able to forward any information that can be there if council takes a break that we can have a little bit of background information? I will endeavor to do my best to send the two motions off to council um, as fast as I can. Okay, if, the, if they're approved to be added, it's always good to have as much information as we can. And we, and we would deal with that to later on on the agenda for sure. Okay, um, are there any other? Okay, go ahead, Councillor Little. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> potentially, there may be um, the desire for a resolution coming out of the Conservation Authority presentation, um, and it would also be time sensitive. So um, perhaps that could go under notice of motion with, uh, with two thirds majority support. Okay. Yeah, because you're, you're bringing it today and it takes two thirds to bring it forward. So we can we can add it in that spot and then uh, speak to it at that time, okay? All right, is there anything else wish to be added from council members or staff or any deletions? Okay, so just to reiterate, there are two items from Councilor Nielsen and also an item from Council Little with regards to a possible notice of motion that will be two thirds majority to bring that forward, depending on the discussion that comes out of the delegation from the Conservation Authority. Can I have a mover and a seconder for those, please? Councilor Nielsen, Councilor Little, any discussion there? Seeing none, all in favor of that motion. That is carried. And I do want to make a comment before we move into open forum. Uh, uh, Councillor Valaquette is not in attendance today. There was only six councillors today and she sends her regrets. Okay, so uh, moving forward then to open forum. Oh, sorry, Madam Clerk. Um, yes, yeah, so we just passed the resolution to add those two items to the agenda. Can we now do a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Right, 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 right. So that was like an amendment to those, right. Okay, so then I need a motion now with the amended agenda. Councilor Nielsen, Councilor Allwick. That is, yes. Any discussion there? Seeing none, all in favor of that motion. Okay, that's carried. Thank you, Madam Clerk. All right, moving on to item three on our agenda is what they uh, for called open forum. And this allows people to uh, sign in and speak to items that are only on our agenda today. And uh, they are allotted three minutes uh, per, per uh, person speaking. And uh, there's no di dialogue back and forth. It's just to provide information to council to items again. And please, when you indicate you're speaking to indicate the item that on the agenda that you wish you're, you're speaking to, okay? So um, uh, either Madam Clerk or Madam Deputy Clerk, uh, do we have anybody wishing to speak? Thank you, Your Worship. Our first speaker, actually we have six speakers today. The first one being Sarah Benjamin and Sarah's is speaking on item 8.2. And Sarah, you should be able to speak now. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yeah, welcome Sarah. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I don't have three minutes worth of 
words to say. I just wanted to be available and I wanted to say thank you for considering this proposal and that I'm available to answer any questions if need be. Okay, so um, generally uh, we don't have dialogue with council on a particular item, but if you are available and, and there is that request from a counselor, there we have to move two thirds majority to allow that happen. And that, that could easily happen if there are questions. So thank you for offering your, your services for that. No problem, thank you. All right, thank you for that. Okay, so um, uh, number two, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk. Thank you. Our second speaker is Kelly Travis. I'm not sure if I've pronounced that correctly. Um, if not, I apologize. Um, Kelly, you should be able to go ahead. Kelly speaking on item 11.2. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Kelly. I think it's Traves, right? Kelly Traves. Hi, can you hear? Good. Okay, yes. so good afternoon. I've been told that a former speaker, the owner of Backyard Chickens at 148 Wellington Street in Feversham was successful having addressed you directly in reversing your decision to uphold the current letter for removal by bylaw. Both my husband and I work full time, which apparently puts us at a strong disadvantage for regular participation because we work the hours meetings are held. I work for mental health and was required to seek special permissions to attend and he is also at work hoping to join. We've had our water source threatened by contamination from neighboring birds. The neighbor has shown blatant disregard for bylaws, our health and safety, and the pleasure and enjoyment for which should be afforded us in our own yard. We're concerned about well contamination and that concern has been reinforced by conversations we've held with the local health unit. The mayor asked if we had UV lighting in our well only validating further it could be an issue. And yet a decision was made without weighing in opposing thoughts that the council would choose not to enforce the current letter served to remove the fowl. In fact, it's been suggested they can be maintained until such time as a potential bylaw may be passed review of which we're told could take between 12 and 18 months. So being aware of potential for water source contamination and choosing to continue to allow it for potential additional 12 to 18 months would put both the violators and the municipality in a position of negligence. When does this end? When are our rights to safe water, health, enjoyment, and reasonable pleasant access to our own property taken into account? Not only do the nine hens and two ducks present the potential risk of well contamination for us, they're in very close vicinity to our well, but as many of you who reviewed emails I've previously forwarded can see, they also frequent our yard. They produce an overwhelming stench. As warmer weather continues, it was 27 degrees the day I wrote this, the smell increases making it a challenge for us to sit on our deck, nor can we open our windows without the smell permeating our home. Our gardens are picked over, plants destroyed, the lawn is scratched and holes are dug regularly. Lastly, I'm concerned if you don't reconsider this decision to extend the stay now, then what are your next steps likely to be? Should a bylaw pass, would you be grandfathering in existing coops? Would, you, would our well and its safety, which was dug long prior to this hobby being adopted by the neighbor, not be protected then either? It is in the line of natural runoff. Would you continue to dismiss the fact that this and other local coops are in the natural runoff direct path and drain into the Beaver River? The property on 148 Wellington Street has a catchment basement on the front lawn, which drains into the Beaver River. Bylaws need to have restrictions that foremost uphold the health and safety needs of residents. As such, I implore you to please reconsider your decision from last council and allow the letter for removal of the foul of 148 Wellington Street in Feversham to stand. Proactively, should a bylaw pass, having conditions inspected and met prior to issuing licensing and permits would offer assurance that adherence met the conditions of reasonable restrictions and would provide financial remuneration to the municipality. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kelly, for, for that. Okay, and just under the wire in three minutes there. So thank you, Madam Clerk, for showing your timer. Um, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, your third speaker. Thank you. Next, we have Eric Tra Tra Travis. Tra sorry, Traves. Tra Traves, Tra I apologize. Tra yeah. And Eric, you should be able to go ahead now. Okay, thank you, Madam Deputy Clerk. Good afternoon, Eric. What are you saying? Good afternoon, Eric. Can you hear me now, Paul? Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. The floor is yours. I would like to address the backyard chickens issue in relation to 148 Wellington Street in Feversham also. Firstly, I would hope that no one at council table has been bullied or intimidated which may influence their decision-making. If this has occurred, they should recuse themselves from weighing in on this issue or consider stepping down permanently. 
Stepping over the removal order and granting a stay where to my knowledge, no conditions were implemented is plain irresponsible. At minimal, the following should have been considered. The number of chickens. Adding the waterfowl has upped the numbers to 11. Ability to contain the birds to their own property. Protection of the water sources and the Beaver River from the runoff of the chicken coops. This property is a catchment basin on the front lawn. Were the birds vet checked to ensure their health? Were building codes, property standards and setbacks taken into consideration? Was the electrical work completed to ES ESA standards? That's the Electrical Standards Association. Guidelines for the lights, for the heating, possibly the cooling, or was it merely an extension cord run across the lawn from the house, which possess, potentially poses a fire hazard from overheating? That could in turn start a fire on their property and or neighboring properties and homes. Until these issues can be addressed, the stay should be removed and the order should be enforced. More generally speaking, with regards to the potential passing of back your chicken bylaw, have you considered that new home builders moving into the area, most subdivision plans have smaller setbacks, bringing homes closer in vicinity. Builders will also build semi-detached and row housing, which brings units closer still to one another. Imagine a six or eight block townhouse complex with backyard chickens in the middle unit, the smell, the frustrations of units, etc. Perhaps backyard chickens should remain barnyard chickens and stay on the farm. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Eric, for your comments. All right, that's number three. Madam Deputy Clerk, you have a uh, fourth person speaking. Thank you. Yes, next we have Lucas Oldfield um, speaking on item 8.6. Okay. Hey, Good afternoon, Lucas. Good afternoon. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, go ahead. Your floor is yours. Okay, perfect. So um, I was talking to Michael Benner, and as a phase two for the proposal for Block G, um, we're looking to rezone lots A through 10 from residential to residential multiple. Um, so I've talked to Michael about submitting that application. And as part of that application, I read through the minutes today uh, around section 8.6. And we would be interested in running a servicing option study that would include that unopened Albert uh, Street to understand what it would take to service that. And also we would be interested in um, assuming uh, the property itself with the associated legal exposure uh, with the well that is actually supposed to be located on lot 10, where the majority, which I've had a survey to show, is located on that Albert Street road allowance. So I'm happy to stick around for section 8.6 if there's going to be future discussion on that to answer any questions around what um, my rezoning would look like or questions with that. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to make it known that we're interested in that unopened road allowance from a development perspective. Hey, thank you, Lucas, for that. And uh, like I said, if you are available and, and council needs would like you to speak, it would take two thirds to allow you to speak, but that, that could happen. Most okay, likely. perfect. I will be on the line. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, thank you for that. All right, uh, speaker five, Madam Deputy Clerk. Speaker five is Carolyn McLeod speaking on item 11.2. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Carolyn. Good afternoon. Carolyn, you're muted still. Sorry about that. Um, technology is not my not my friend. I understand I have three minutes to uh, speak to my concern regarding uh, the deputy mayor's motion to reconsider our stay that was originally supported at your meeting held June the 2nd. I'm a registered nurse and have been for 29 years and I currently work as the administrator of a long-term care home in Simcoe County. The PPE you see me wearing um, along with my three time weekly uh, COVID swabs is my current reality. Unfortunately, that's also the reality of my children. Um, and that uh, to say the last 15 months have been uh, demanding and stressful would be an understatement. Unfortunately, I'd also think that this would apply to my children as well. My son is 13, my daughter is 12, and they've been out of their school environment more than in. They've had to adjust their academic lives and their social lives. Because of my profession, me being on call 24 seven, they've lost countless hours with their mom. And my hope is that they see and learn a work ethic, drive and compassion. 
We've been fortunate that my husband has been able to stay at home with them in April of 2020, well over a year ago. After researching the entire process, we allowed our daughter to purchase 10 laying hens. She was required to do that research, feeding, watering, all of those kinds of things. She purchased her 10 laying hens, keeping these hens in a makeshift brooder in our living room until they were outside ready. We were aware that other municipalities surrounding us are able to do this, Meaford, Durham, West Gray, et cetera. In fact, if you took a tour of our, our local, um, our town, which some of you actually did this past weekend, you would see that our, our backyard is, is, not, um, is not the only backyard in Feversham that has these. Each of the hens has a name. You can pick one of our hens up, you can pet them. They'll fall asleep in your lap. When she takes them outside of their enclosure, they follow her. Maybell's our escape artist. She did fly the coop, so to speak, and we raised the fence. Our chickens can't get out unless you take them out. We've noticed recently that there've been edges lifted up on, the, on our coop. Whether someone's been doing that purposely or not, we can't say. Unfortunately, one of our girls was taken at dusk. We believe it could have been a predator. We're not sure, but that does happen. A year goes by. Our daughter is giving away her eggs that are produced by her chickens. We don't sell them. We don't have a, a cart at the end of our laneway. She gives them to people. She gives them to neighbors. In fact, the neighbors that perhaps are complaining have eaten those eggs that our, children's have, that our children have produced. <clears throat> spring, com spring comes around. We're in the third wave of COVID. She wants two ducks. Again, we require the research from her. Milo and Otis join our family, join our family at four days old. They live in a kiddie pool in her bedroom until they develop feathers. My daughter has harnesses for her ducks and she has leashes for her ducks. They'll follow her around in the backyard. She takes them for walks in town. I don't hear any mention of that by the fact that she has pets that she takes out. That brings us to the current situation. A visit from bylaw, then a letter from bylaw saying our property is not zoned for livestock. Our birds aren't livestock, they're pets. You people have pets. Karen, can you wrap it up? Can you wrap it up? You're sort of ran out of time Absolutely. to speak. Absolutely. You've toured Feversham. The deputy mayor says that we need to have some, they need recourse. We need recourse. How do I tell my daughter that we have to call her pets? Where do we take her pets? We need an answer. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, Councilor Nielsen, you had your hand up. Yes, please. Just a question for clarity to the person. You said you raised the fence around your, your coop. How yes, high is your fence? And is there a roof on the fence? There's no roof so, on the fence, sir, but it's just, at least just, just hang on. Just our our procedural doesn't allow questions to our delegations through open forum. So um, I want I want to keep to the rules here. We only allow comments to be made, not to have that dialogue back and forth. As far as um, I may be wrong, Madam Clerk, is that the correct procedure? We're getting comments on. Yes, Your Worship. There is no uh, communication between open forum people and council or anybody else. Sorry about that, Councillor Nielsen. Um, and, and thank you, Car uh, uh, Carolyn, for your. I, I have to stick to the rules of three minutes for, for everyone. That's fine. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, our sixth person wishing to speak, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk. Thank you. Our last speaker is Jim Harold speaking on item 10.3. Good afternoon, Jim. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I'm actually speaking on 10.3 or 9.1. Um, I would like to talk about the exciting matter of tax ratios. Um, I, I, I noticed that you passed the uh, um, motion a couple of meetings ago about uh, getting rid of the vacant unit rebate. And that's the essence of what I wanna talk about. Um, but I, I'm talking about it at a very general level. I'm not here representing any particular property, any particular uh, partnership I might be in, any organization. I'm just uh, expressing my personal views. Um, I understand the, uh, the uh, preference to comply with the uh, action that was taken by the county uh, to also get rid of the vacant unit rebate. And I do question, though, the timing of it, um, because there are two types of vacant units. There are vacant units that have been sitting idle for years, 
And I can understand that you can make a change there at any time. There are other commercial units that are vacant because they've been hit by pandemic and, and small uh, operations being forced to close. And I just raise that as a, as a concern. Um, and I, I uh, ask you to, again, reflect on that. Secondly, on the question of uh, commercial uh, taxes, um, I noticed that the county and other municipalities, when they eliminated the vacant unit rebate, they also took action to make sure that there was a reduction in the overall tax ratio to make sure that there was an additional commercial uh, tax gained. I'm unclear as to whether that is happened in 21 tax ratio for commercial. I know it's down from 2020, but that may be a question to ask when the report is being presented. Finally, I, I applaud you for addressing commercial tax structure, but I do think that Gray Highlands needs to have a more comprehensive review of its commercial tax structure. Uh, right now, um, I think that there is uh, having uh, commercial taxes paying a one third premium on average over residential taxes. There is an incentive for people to um, uh, operate retail or commercial operations under the guise of home occupation um, and not pay any additional taxes that way. I think you need to understand that and perhaps conduct a, a more fulsome review of your commercial tax structure as you go through 21 and in preparation for your 22 tax season. I know, uh, I, I thank you very much for, for listening to my, my concern and, and uh, three minutes on taxes and you're still awake. Thank you very much. Jim, just before you leave, Jim, can you, re, can you re, 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 um, iterate that question you had for the county? I, I just didn't quite write it down, just correct it. Can you re, <clears throat> repeat that question? Well, the, 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 the question, um, was when the county and other municipalities lower, uh, got rid of the vacant tax rebate, they also lowered the uh, tax ratio for commercial properties as to not gain any additional revenue um, and, and sort of offset. That's how I read the reports. And um, I couldn't get some clarity on that because some of the links in the report in 9.1 aren't working. They, uh, they, uh, they say the link isn't working. So I wasn't able to justify that or, or, or to uh, research that in, in more detail at this point. Thank you very much. I just wanted clarity for myself, Deputy Mayor, and the rest of the council, yep. what exactly yes. you, were, you were zeroing in there. So thank you for that. <clears throat> Good. Okay. Um, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, that takes care of our open forum. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Mayor McQueen, that's all of our speakers for today. Okay, thank you. And thank you for those taking the time to speak to us. I have to run a very tight timeline on the three minutes because we try to be fair with everyone. And I apologize if, if I cut you off, but uh, that's the rules we have for everyone. So, okay. Uh, then moving on to item four on our agenda, uh, the point of declaration of pecuniary interest. We have approved an amended agenda. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest with regards to any items on the agenda? Uh, Councilor Allwick. Uh -huh. I declare pecuniary interest on item uh, 8.5. Uh, Wilton Sanitation is a client of my wife's business. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Are there any other uh, declarations? All right, seeing none, we'll move on then to item five. The approval of- uh, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, oh, sorry, go ahead, Councilor Allen. Um, yes, I need to declare on 10.3. Yes. Um, as I've stated before, I have commercial property, own commercial property that has received that rebate in the past. Okay, gotcha. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll put one more call out call out there. Are there any other pecuniary, uh, uh, pecuniary interest with regards to items on the agenda from council members? If one does arise and you realize at that time, you can still declare it when, if it becomes uh, an issue. So we have three sets of minutes. The first one was a special meeting of council, uh, I Westway Capital Delegation. Could I have a mover and a seconder for those, please? Councillor Little, have a seconder. Councillor Allwood. 
Any discussion on those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Okay. Opposed? That was carried. Deputy Mayor, are you are you opposed to that? Or I, I am in favor. Sorry. I was trying okay. to, um, yeah. Okay. So that was approved unanimously. Uh, the second set of minutes is uh, of um, June 1st, uh, special council meeting, uh, STA appeal hearing. Can I have a point more of clarity, second? your worship? And this is, this is why I, I had the hesitation because I had to go back. Uh, the point of clarity I'm requesting here is I was not present at that meeting because I had a, um, a conflict of interest. Uh, so I will yes. uh, refrain from voting on this. Um, do I have to leave the meeting uh, while so it's being did, discussed and voted on? Or so you you did declare at the next available meeting. Correct. Uh, so I'll, see, I'll just hang on. I'll seek some guidance here from the clerk if she's able to provide. Uh, Madam Clerk, um, the issue of hand was with regards to that particular meeting. The deputy mayor did not attend. He did declare at the next available meeting that he was in pre present. His question is, and maybe you can't answer it, does he need to declare uh, of the minutes because he wasn't present, but does he need to declare because uh, he, he, was, he made a declaration to the items that were discussed in that particular minute? Or, or rather, can I abstain from voting, basically? Uh, thank you, Mayor McQueen. Um, I'm not allowed to provide any guidance yeah. in relation to declaring pecuniary interest. However, any member can abstain from voting on any item. I will abstain from voting your worship. Okay. Thank you for that, Deputy Mayor. We, we learn as we go along here. <laughs> okay. I need a mover and a seconder, please, for those at, uh, that set Councilor Nielsen. Second by kind of seconder, please. Councilor Allwood. Again, that was for the hearing for the STA. Are there any items to be discussed, errors or omissions with regards to those set of minutes? All right, seeing none, all in favor of those minutes? Opposed, those were carried. Okay, and the deputy mayor abstained. The next set of minutes are of the June 2nd council meeting. And uh, can I have a mover and a seconder for those please? Uh, Councilor Nielsen, Deputy Mayor. Any errors or omissions or anything to discuss on those sets of minutes? All right, seeing none, all in favor of those. That's carried. Okay. All right, so then moving forward, then we, on our community of the whole, we had a set of minutes of our community of the whole with regards to the Grey Highlands lens in the minutes of, uh, that was of the morning of the council of that day. Can I have a mover and a seconder for those? Councilor Nielsen, second by Councilor Little. Any, any errors or just uh, uh, points to raise of those sets of minutes? All right, seeing none, all in favor of those. Those are carried. Okay. All right. So item seven on our agenda is for delegations. And we have a delegation here from the Grace Alvo Conservation Authority, along with the Nottosaga Valley Conservation Authority. And we do have a presenter. Mr. Greg is available. He was going to introduce our two groups. Mr. Greg is the chair of the Grace Alvo Conservation Authority. Madam Clerk, or Deputy Thank you, Clerk, Mayor Queen, oh, Council staff, uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Scott, and welcome. Thank you for listening to us today. I am Scott Gregg, a current Owen Sound City Councillor and the current board chair for Grace Salvo Conservation. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to look in today at uh, Councillor Little, who uh, I would just like to acknowledge to uh, your council how valuable uh, Councillor Little uh, served the Conservation Authority in her role for several years as the past chair. Uh, she offered tremendous years of guidance and leadership. Uh, and uh, if I forgot dedication, then dedication should be in there as well. So uh, great to see her today. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce Tim. 
uh, as well today. He's uh, the current uh, CAO of Gray Sobel, as well as Doug Hevner of Nottawasaga. Uh, Tim joined Gray Sobel in 2006 uh, in the planning department and uh, worked through uh, conservation lands management and has been our CAO for approximately a year and a half. And he's uh, met some unanticipated challenges, obviously from COVID to modifications uh, to the Conservation Authorities Act, as well as uh, tremendous stress uh, from tourism that's locating uh, itself on our properties, as well as some of your properties in your municipality. So with that introduction, I'd like to turn it over then to uh, Tim to uh, present uh, to you today. Thanks. Thank you very much, Scott. And um, hello, Council. Thank you for having us here today. Uh, we appreciate your time. What I want to talk to you about today is some of the changes that have occurred recently to the Conservation Authorities Act, and more recently, uh, the release of um, the regulatory proposal consultation guide from the province. So I understand that I only have a handful of minutes here, and there is quite a lot of material to go over. So I will try to go through it pretty quickly. We'll keep it generally high level today. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, we can maybe hold those at the end of the uh, of the presentation if, um, if your bylaws allow. Uh, slide, please. So very, very quickly, I'll go over Gray Sobel, a bit of background on Gray Sobel. We have eight member municipalities that extends generally from town of South Bruce Peninsula in the uh, Northwest over to the town of the Blue Mountains in the Northeast, down to yourselves, Gray Highlands in the Southeast and back over to Aaron Eldersley in the other corner. Uh, we have 11 board members, uh, all elected officials. Our watershed area covers 3,100 square kilometers, including 155 kilometers of shoreline. We operate a $3.1 million annual budget with approximately 25 staff. And we offer a suite of very valuable programs to all the communities throughout our watershed, including uh, programs that protect people and property, uh, programs that offer stewardship and forestry, and programs for uh, the management of conservation authority lands, which you will recognize as uh, very important to the tourism industry in Grey Bruce and specifically in the municipality of Grey Highlands, where collectively we see over two to 300,000 people visiting our properties per year. Slide, please. So this is a very high level breakdown of Grey Sobel. The shaded area is our watershed jurisdiction. The dark green outline is the source water protection jurisdiction. And you can see a pie chart uh, illustrating what our budget looks like at a very high level. So you can see that about half of that is self-generated, a little under half of that is municipal levy. The small blue piece of the pie there is drinking water source protection, which covers the expanded watershed area and is paid for by the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. The very small gray sliver is what the province pays towards section 39. So that's our flood forecasting and warning and natural hazard work. It's about $37,000 out of a $3.1 million budget. So the point of showing you this today is to express that, especially from a budget perspective, but also from a working perspective, this is very much about a relationship, a working relationship and a partnership between our member municipalities and ourselves. And Doug, I think you wanted to touch briefly on your budget at this point as well. You're muted, Doug. Our, our budget is more aligned to a 50-50 mix here, and uh, we receive approximately 178,000 in source water protection, and approximately 1% of uh, our budget is for the remaining sliver that Tim's just indicated there. There you go. Thank you. Next slide, please. So what I wanna talk about today um, in the remaining time is are these regulatory changes that are coming under the Conservation Authorities Act to support the changes that happened to the legislation over the past five years. What the province has released is what they're considering to be phase one of the regulatory proposals, and it can generally be considered in four categories. So these are defining mandatory versus non-mandatory programs, which is a new theme under the Conservation Authorities Act. Transition plans and MOUs. So the transition plans will get us to the MOUs and the MOUs will take us into the future with these mandatory and non-mandatory program areas. Community advisory boards 
and Section 29 regulations, which are the regulations that we apply to our own properties. Slide, please. So what is mandatory? The province has uh, defined mandatory programs for the Conservation Authority as programs and services related to the risk of natural hazards, programs and services related to the management of Conservation Authority owned and managed lands, drinking water source protection. Uh, they all have also included the Lake Simcoe Protection Act, but that doesn't apply to uh, CAs outside of the Lake Simcoe area. And they've, they've, they included a clause in the legislation that said anything else that we prescribe within a year. So what they've come forward with in these regulatory proposals is a core watershed based resource management strategy and water quality monitoring and uh, water quality and quantity monitoring. So those are two new items. Uh, the water quality and quantity we do is a partnership with the, with the uh, ministry, but it's new that they're added as mandatory programs. So the natural hazards items are very similar to the work that we do today, section 28, uh, development permits, commenting on planning act applications. The management of conservation lands has been scoped by the ministry to be just um, for natural heritage and biodiversity purposes. And they've explicitly removed recreational uses from the mandatory. So for us, that would be trails and the like. Slide, please. Everything else is considered non-mandatory. And so that breaks into two categories. Those are municipal service agreements like the planning agreements that we have with your municipality or risk management agreements to uh, provide source water protection work on the ground. And everything else is other programs and services that are deemed to be important by our board of directors. Slide please. Under the current levy structure, all of these programs can be applied to levy and our board of directors made up of elected officials reviews our levy and votes in a weighted vote on the total budget as well as what portion of that budget is, is made up of levy. So municipalities have a say into what that levy is. Slide please. Under the new structure, only the mandatory programs as well as uh, overhead costs will be included in that, what would, I guess we can consider a mandatory levy. Everything else, those municipal services and the other programs and services, if they require levy, this will require an MOU between the conservation authority and the municipalities. Slide, please. So for Gray Sauble Conservation, this is a general breakdown of how that plays out across our program areas. We'll be coming back to talk to you again or, or to your senior staff anyway, uh, as the year progresses so that we can lay out specifically as part of our transition plan, which programs we feel are under the mandatory section which are municipal services and which are other programs and services. And as part of our transition plan, we'll consult with the municipality to make sure that you agree with our breakdown of that and what the costs are associated with that. Slide, please. So in terms of getting things done and moving forward, the, uh, the consultation guide provides until the end of this year to have transition plans in place the end of next year to have the MOU agreements in place. And this is going to require um, some effort on both the parts of the conservation authorities, but also on the parts of our municipal uh, partners. Um, we'll actually probably be looking at having those agreements in place sooner, because as you know, there'll be a municipal election next year and there's the potential of lame duck that would uh, make it uh, ineffective for us to try and get those agreements signed in the latter half of the year. Slide please. The next couple of slides are about community advisory boards. I won't go into the details on these, um, but essentially we're going to be required to establish community advisory boards to advise our board of directors. And the ministry will define certain aspects of what these boards will look like and locally will define some other parts. Now I do see that the timer has gone off um, with the discretion of council. If, if you're willing, I can finish the presentation. So, okay, let's, let's take a pause there. So is, is there uh, interest from council to go past our 10 minutes? If there are, I need a, a motion to go past our allotted time for our procedure bylaw. <coughs> Speak up if you can. I would move your worship, Councillor Little. I'll second <laughs> your worship, Councillor Nielsen. Move, move by Councillor Little, second Councillor Nielsen. And I think we need two thirds majority to, to carry that. So pretty much all of us need to support that. So. Um, 
I can't see everybody. Um, <clears throat> to Council Bowood is in favor. Okay, so why don't I do it this way then? Okay, there we are. So I need uh, all those in favor of going past the 10 minutes for the delegation. Okay, there you go. Thank you very much. Carry on, Tim. Thank you very I much. I didn't say Tim. how much farther, but <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Finish your, finish your presentation. Thank you. So as I mentioned, the community advisory boards are uh, some, of the, some of that information will be defined by the province. The remainder will be defined by a terms of reference by our board of directors. And it will give the general populace an opportunity to uh, have direct comment to our board on a regular basis. Uh, slide, please. Slide, please. Slide, please. Thank you. The changes to our Section 29 regulations is another portion of, of this uh, regulatory proposal. And it, these are the regulations, as I said, that we apply to our own properties. So they include things like permits for camping, parking, um, what you can and can't do on the properties. There's no intent to change those, just to consolidate them into one regulation. Slide, please. So that was uh, very, very high level, very quick going through that. Uh, there are some concerns that come out for us in, this, um, in these proposals. One is the timelines for the agreements, um, simply because we're looking at having the transition plans in place by the end of this year, but we haven't seen the phase one regulations yet, and we haven't seen anything about the phase two regulations yet, and we're already midway through June. Um, so, we can start working on them. And I know uh, I know Doug and his team have started working on it at their authority, and I think everyone has, uh, but we can't really finalize these until we know what the target is that we're aiming at. Another concern for us and for Grace Sobel anyway, and this is a big concern, is the um, exclusion of recreational uses from the mandatory land management side of things. So as you're aware, there are a lot of people coming to Gray, Gray and Bruce counties, Simcoe County, uh, and specifically Gray Highlands for recreational, outdoor recreational tourism. And Gray Sobel and other conservation authorities play a key role in that outdoor recreational tourism. Um, the concern here is that if we have to start teasing out how we're managing our lands between natural heritage and recreation, even for passive recreation like trails, uh, it's going to be a big administrative burden, but it could also uh, destabilize the program. The final primary concern for Gray Sobel is, is cost and capacity. So there are a lot of things that have been raised by the ministry through this, um, this proposal that are new. And until we see the details on that, we don't know what that'll mean in terms of uh, the existing dollars that we have to provide programs today and what we need to provide tomorrow. So that may mean uh, reducing costs in one area to raise them in another, or it may mean increased levy costs to cover the, uh, the increased cost of providing these services if there are new um, requirements. Slide, please. So the next steps will be for us to continue to meet with uh, municipal councils and staff. We will be providing comments on the uh, environmental registry posting, which are due by June 27th. Uh, we will be working on the transition plan, and then ultimately we'll be working on the MOUs. There are some other items that have been raised, but timelines uh, on those have not been provided yet. Slide, please. Uh, slide, please. We expect that uh, an item will come in phase two, as the province has let us know, that the overhead costs that authorities have to run our businesses in terms of corporate services, IT, fleet, things like that, will be eligible for a minimum levy. And this is a little bit of a different take on uh, how we collect levy today. So again, we'll talk in more detail with your staff at a future date on what all of these things mean between us as partners uh, and get those ironed out. And at a very high level, very quickly said, <laughs> that is uh, an overview of the, uh, the regulatory proposal that's before us. Um, I encourage council to read through it and consider what it means to your municipality. I'm absolutely available at any time to discuss it. And I would encourage you to have your, your senior staff review it and, uh, and ask questions as necessary as well. Thank you. Doug, did, and I'm sorry, Doug, I did a lot of talking there if you had anything to add. 
Thank you very much, Tim. If I may, through the mayor, uh, I just want to express how this legislation works as a double-edged sword. We look at the recreation component and the funding for recreational services in conservation areas, and you look at the TIFFIN site for the NDCA. Uh, we support upwards of 15,000 school children in educational programs at the TIFFIN site annually. So if we're not maintaining the parking lots, we're not maintaining the washroom facilities, we're not maintaining the trails or the open space areas in those recreational areas, that's gonna severely impact the educational component. Um, right now, the decisions that we have to make as we move forward in this is, is how, how much do we want to partner with each other and how much do we wanna look at a watershed delivery? In, in the current budget, 18 municipalities support education. But I think if we took a little scalpic look at education in the NDCA, the lion's share of the demographics support that the, the program is supported by Barry's children, Innisfil's children, and S's children. But I think everyone sees the benefit of education to the overall process in the watershed. So that's how we're gonna have to start to look at things. And, and what Tim alluded to as extra costs is this resource management piece, the strategies and the management strategies that would be involved in that could add costs. If source water protection is added into the municipal scheme of things versus the uh, province's payments, that, that's a huge impact on, on our budgets for 2023. So we look forward to working with you. And as Tim said, he's open to communication and I'm open to any, any communication with members or uh, yourself, your worship. Um, happy to speak to this issue and thank you so much for having us here today. Well, thank you uh, both for speaking today and certainly uh, Councillor Little is our representative from Council for Grace Salvo and Councillor Nielsen is our representative for NBCA. Just a question for clarity and there may be other questions here. So. I'm looking at, I'm not sure which slide, slide the transitional plans and MOU. So it says here that the non-mandatory programs and services are required to be in place for January 1st. So is that where it's, the first question is, is that where it's gonna really affect the budget in the sense of, of the 2023 budget? And 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 maybe I'll, I'll, I'll put a couple other parts in it. It says that we have to have a transitional plan by December 31st, 2021. So. From a financial point or from an MOU financial part, where is that going to then start to come back to us? Because as we go through a budget process, then we have to understand if there are other changes for our budgeting and stuff and, and that process. So can you just explain a little bit clearer on those timeframes in the sense of, I guess, where the rubber hits the road and, and, and from a budget point and from funding and I guess also from a transitional plan, you're talking about whether the board looks at fee structure changes or user fees changing and stuff. Can, can you just sort of maybe speak to that just a little more, just in the sense of those, those benchmark times? Sure, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so what we're looking at is ultimately the end goal here is to have MOUs in place for non-mandatory programs that require municipal levy. So if we can fund them ourselves, they don't need an MOU. But if we can't, they do. And those need to be executed and operating by January 1st, 2023. With the municipal election occurring next year, chances are, and just budget development for that matter, chances are we're going to have to have those signed um, a lot sooner than that. What the transition plan is, is a requirement from the ministry uh, that conservation authorities will consult with our member municipalities to define what programs we believe are mandatory and non-mandatory and what the costs associated with those are. And that we'll consult with you so that you agree with us on that. So that'll be part of the transition plan. The rest of the transition plan will be explaining to the ministry how we're gonna get from how we operate today to how we're gonna be operating January 1st, 2023 and what that looks like and uh, what steps we're going to take to get us there. So as I mentioned in the presentation quickly, is the challenge is, is we don't fully know what the target is that we're aiming at yet because we haven't yeah. actually seen these regulations. Right, and that's those submissions have to be in by the 27th of June, which is coming quickly and then what comes out of that as well. Okay, so basically in a, in a summary then, basically the first quarter to the second quarter of next year is going to be 
a lot of roll up the sleeves and figure a lot of things out because if you said like there's an election next fall, you get into that transition period. So you want to have a lot of stuff in play almost by mid year next year. I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that clarity. I think that's so important to have that clarity in the sense that from, from the process and also from, from this council's process as well. Okay. Thank you. Questions. Um, so, oh, sorry, Doug, you had a comment there before about a question? Um, just one comment, if I could. I think the, the most understandable communication here would be that the 2022 budget is status quo. It would be coming yes. to your councils as it has in the past. So just yeah. to clear that up for you. Okay. Thanks for that, because I was thinking that in the back of my mind as well. And as sort of, it's there's a bit of time, but next year is going to be busy to determine what that items that are going to be associated with that 2023 budget, but it has to be in place for January 1st. So very important to say. Uh, questions for clarity from council members? <clears throat> or maybe I got a council little. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, that June 27th deadline is fast approaching and we don't have a council meeting between now and then. Um, and, I, and I, it sounds like it would be difficult for us to frame something that would be supportive of the municipal per, municipal position in the in these changes, as well as the conservation authority's position in these changes. Um, and I think it it makes perfect sense to have staff um, Gray Sobel and Ottawa Saga Valley um, staff speaking with municipal Gray Highland staff. Um, is there any benefit or? potential even for requesting an extension to that deadline for consultation? Or is there some process outside of that consultation process um, for municipalities to um, make their, their concerns known? So are you asking that to our two speakers? Yes, I am, thanks. Yeah, okay, so either Tim or Doug, go ahead. I'll give it a shot, Tim. Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Little. Um, I think the opportunity exists beyond this to write directly to the Minister of Natural or the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks and the Premier. The opportunity to speak within the window of June 27th expires on June 27th. I don't think there's that opportunity. Uh, just for your, your own ears, we met as general managers just recently and uh, some uh, advocacy and communication points were brought forward from Conservation Ontario. Uh, where they're going to be encouraging the government to reconsider the uh, uh, lands component for the trail systems and, and the, the non-mandatory non versus mandatory. Uh, and they would like them to take a closer look at natural heritage features in regards to stewardship on uh, areas of private land rather than just conservation authority owned land. Uh, both of our organizations provide a lot of stewardship through the form of restoration and, and uh, uh, eco management. And so if we're not doing it on conservation authority lands in this new regime, we wouldn't be mandatory. We'd have to work into an agreement to do that. And we do a lot of work with our agricultural partners in both watersheds and a lot of work through forest management plans. So I think it would really encourage you to, to write to uh, the government. Okay, uh, Tim. Tim, do you have anything to add there? And then I'll go back to Council Little. No, I, I think I think Doug did uh, did cover that nicely. Thank you, Council Little. Do you have any follow up questions to that? No, thanks. That was helpful. Okay. Any other questions? The thought I had was, and this is just thought, was I think um, with changes to climate change, I think the Conservation Authority uh, is going to have a strong role on different um, changes to, the, to uh, our climate changes. And, and I know a lot of municipalities have, are working on plans and different things like that. I just wondered if, if uh, either Tim or Doug had any, any comments to that or has your board spoke to uh, maybe a future role with regards to climate change initiatives? And is that something that should be commented by the 27th of June? Go ahead, Tim. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think, it, it, personally, it's my opinion that all the work that conservation authorities do has um, has positive effects on either adaptation or mitigation of climate change. And we've just never historically framed it that way, but everything we do 
has to do with protecting people and adapting mm -hmm. to climate change. In terms of moving forward, under the natural hazards section, um, the ministry is, is placing a clause in there that we will look at natural hazards as part of, or as um, we will look at climate change as part of our review of natural hazards. But on the other side of the table, when we start looking at the management of our own lands or, or taking the knowledge that we've gained managing our lands and applying that to private property or municipal properties, uh, I think there's a great opportunity there, but in the future, it may have to be through a service agreement or some other such mechanism. Okay. Okay. And then I don't know if Doug, you have anything to add to that or not, but. Um... Uh, the NDCA, uh, we've created a climate change strategy that occurred in 2018 and was brought forward to our board with complete approval. And I'd just like to uh, strengthen Tim's support that they have put steps in there for us to address climate change. It's just really hidden. There's a lot of uh, uh, shadowy comments in this legislation. I just wonder if that should be reinforced because I think going forward, there are going to be some, some, we're seeing it, we're seeing it, we're understanding it. We, we have, we've, you know, came to the conclusion that we are seeing the effects on, and I, personally myself, I think that would be something that is a strong anchor to putting something in play that says, look, there are things changing and somebody needs to take that initiative or not the initiative, but take, you know, take the, maybe it's not responsibility, but take, the ownership of, of, of that somewhat, or, or there's a place to go with that. You know what I mean? And, and that sort of thing. So Doug? Just one final comment. If we go back to 2017, 2016, when uh, the minister Yurik suggested, uh, right about the time when Emo was out, that conservation authorities only have four core areas of work and they should immediately stop doing everything else that they do. This these regulations and this legislative changes, they've been really labor synonymous and we think some of them are very challenging, but the door is open for us to work as partners to ensure that all the great work that conservation authorities do continues. And that's a really big win for us. And I just wanna to speak to the, the committee that was involved. It involved stakeholders from AMO, it had mayors from, from watershed uh, participants. It had a proponent from the development community. It had some of the really sage wisdom from conservation authorities participating in it. People that have understand the Conservation Authorities Act very, very thoroughly. And it was a really good dialogue and it was really wholesome and respectful and confrontational at times. They were immediately told right at the start, some topics are just taboo, we're not gonna discuss them. And everyone agreed to that. And they moved forward and you can see how this collaborative work was, was taken forward. And that happened because 150,000 voices in Ontario rose up to this legislation, Schedule 6 in Bill 229. If that voice wouldn't have happened, if that advocacy wouldn't have happened, we would be looking at a totally different set of circumstances here. And uh, kudos to councils like yours that have stepped up and supported conservation authorities in the past. That's Tim and my hope that you continue to do that because we have to be the advocates for our future, for ourselves, for our children, for our grandchildren. I'm a grandfather. I do this work because I want my grandchildren to enjoy the green spaces they have about them. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Doug. And uh, okay, um, any other comments? Um, just going back to you, Councillor Little, you did indicate something that maybe would come out of this uh, delegation. Uh, do you have any, or are you looking at to bringing something forward later on or? Is, or you did mention I just going back yeah, to you. I wasn't sure um, what how we should proceed given the um, given the, the deadline, but I think the direction from both Tim and Doug um, to to actually write the minister and the and the premier with with our concerns gives us more time, and I think it's especially important to have you know staff dialogue too um, to help craft something that's going to you know express our position. So. Um, Probably something generic in uh, under notice of motion, just giving staff direction, municipal staff direction is um, what I'm thinking, unless there are other opinions around the table. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Councillor. Are there other comments, uh, opinions around the table? Um, just to iterate, there's also AMO, and just uh, I'm also on AMO's executive as well, so keep that in mind. Okay, well, uh, we'll leave it at that. I see there's no other, uh, I see Councilor Nielsen has maybe left this for the moment, but um, okay, well, thank you very much for attending, Tim and, and Doug, and uh, 
keep up uh, the great work you do. And uh, thanks, uh, Scott, for inter introducing our speakers today. And uh, uh, congratulations, and uh, continue the great work you're doing as chair of Grace Audible. So all the best, everyone. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye now. OK, so council, we've been at this for uh, two or for an hour. Uh, you can keep going. Or what's your wish? Uh, that's our delegation. What's your wish? Uh, Councilor Allwood? Oh, we need a motion to receive. <laughs> yes. Uh, Councilor Allwood, are you moving that? You're, you're mute. I'm, I'll move that we receive the uh, delegation for uh, information. Yeah, I see Councilor Little is seconding that. Uh, any further discussion on that item? Seeing none, uh, all in favor? That is carried. All right. So um, your, my, my question for, for council, would you want me to keep going just quickly, yes or no, or I can, we can take a, a quick break, what you wish. All right, I'll keep going. <laughs> you, you, yeah, you missed that opportunity. We'll keep going for a little bit further. All right, so the next item is 8.1, sale of surplus land request. Uh, this is uh, with regards to CELON. And uh, so we have a report here uh, from the clerk. Would somebody care to put that motion on the floor? Councilor Allwood, do I have a seconder? Do I have a seconder? Councilor, Deputy Mayor. Sorry, I guess I guess if I don't get a seconder, or I guess if I don't get a motion, it doesn't get on the floor. So, <laughs> so, all right. So the motion is on the floor for the sale of surplus land for the request for in Ceylon, and the report is there. That so I'll read it off. Uh, moved by Councilor Owen, second by Deputy Mayor, that the council receive report CLS twenty one nineteen sale of surplus land request Ceylon, and that council declare the lands. Identified as roll number 4208-180-0041201 as being surplus to the municipality needs and that council direct staff to obtain an appraisal for the land and that council direct that the, the this disposition method uh, uh, for the property be, be marketed by the municipality and accepting sealed offers. Discussion on that motion. Councilor Allen. And then Deputy Thank Mayor. you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the um, obtaining an appraisal for the land, um, I'm sure it's in the policy that we are supposed to do that. I'm just wondering in this case, if we're going to declare it surplus and um, basically we're going to sell it, um, I guess if the offers came in as $1, $2, and $3, perhaps we wouldn't, but is there a need for an appraisal and the expense of an appraisal? Um, does that just give us a, a way out of selling it if the, the offers aren't at appraised value? Uh, I guess I'm gonna to go to the Madam Clerk. Can we waive the appraisal? Go ahead, Madam Clerk. Um, the policy itself provides that we will not sell any lands for less than the appraised value, which is the requirement for the appraisal. Um, if we were to market, uh, we would say that the lowest bid would be the appraised value plus the cost of the appraisal, so the municipality wouldn't be out any funds um, for the disposition of the land. Okay, thank you for that clarity. Councillor Allen, do you have a follow-up to that? So basically, if a piece of land came in and it was worth a thousand dollars, and we got two dollars, I guess we wouldn't be selling it according to the policy. Okay. Do we have any any quotes, Madam Clerk, on the appraisal costs? I know right now appraisals are quite expensive. It seems like uh, I guess it's because of lots of things happening, maybe. But do you have any idea what it may cost? And I, I, if you don't, don't answer the question because <laughs> I'm not going to picture. No. Okay. All right. Other, um, so this is us reiterating the policy that we have in place that we have approved. We were, the motion is determining its surplus and there's a process. Are there, sorry, Deputy Mayor, you were next. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, the report and I'm looking at the map on page five of seven. And the, the question that I have is, is to the, um, 
what I'm assuming would be the west of the highlighted property. There is an empty uh, piece. Is that is that um, an unopened road allowance, or is that is that a um, is that property owned by someone else? Because I know it's it says it's landlocked. I'm just not sure what that piece of property is. Thank you. So just for clarity before you go, are you talking about the last property that ends in 200 or are you talking about the road allowance parcel with the site? So I'm talking about that parcel that's between 201 and 800. And I'm, I'm guessing that's the road allowance. And so, so sort of between 900 and 800, that, that bit yeah. there. The long strip piece. Yes, the long strip. Yes. That is it, a road allowance. Good. Okay. Um, so it's not showing on this mapping that was included here, but additional mapping and research on this shows that that is actually split in two, and that front part of it is actually a property, a parcel that is owned by somebody else. So it's been dispositioned already. Um, I can't. Yeah. I'm just saying that on the GIS system, it's showing that that is actually two parcels, that long strip that we're looking at that looks like a road allowance in this mapping, and that the front part of it, uh, which lines up with the um, 9900 one, um, is actually owned by somebody else. Okay. okay. Um, and and the, the other question, I guess, is the, the difference between the recommendation here and the recommendation on uh, the Maxwell uh, ball diamond it is one of the main reasons the fact that this is in fact a landlocked uh, parcel and the other was a was one that was still being used by public and and I guess the comments that was received was that the biggest difference between the two thank you uh, Go ahead, man, Clerk. Uh, thank you, Mayor McQueen. Yeah, it was my assertion that these are completely different requests. Uh, the first one is recreational lands um, that is being used by some of the comments received by members of the public, whereas this land is a landlocked parcel that has not been used for anything as far as we're aware. Um, and the comments for this one is completely positive for the disposition as opposed to the other one where there was conflicting uh, comments coming in. Thank you so much. Okay. Are there other questions? Councillor Nielsen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a question for regarding the policy. I know um, the recommendation is that we put it up for um, silent auction and, and closed bids. Um, my question for that, I, I, I'm, I'm concerned that somebody puts in a bid that might not understand the undevelopable nature of the property, right? So somebody might see the property and think, oh, it's an opportunity to own land and I can hang on to it and then I'm gonna sell it later. And um, our, our dispositional land policy states that this is the way we take care of these things. And I understand that there's opportunities for other landowners that are adjacent to this property that may be interested in the property. However, um, thinking out loud to council as a whole, wondering if there's room to go outside of that policy to sell to the person who's asking, considering that their land abuts on this on multiple edges. It just seems to me, um, I don't see the logic in going out to that silent closed bid where some outside person can end up buying it and then it, um, it doesn't work. So I'm just thought out there to council and, um, I know it would take council's opinion to go outside of the policy. So that's kind of why I'm throwing that out there. Does anybody else share my opinion on this one? So just before I go to other questions and I got you in a minute, Councillor Allen, I wonder if we need a comment from our planner because as you, I, I get what you're saying, Councillor Nielsen, it's landlocked. So how is somebody going to get to it if they have no way to get to it? But there could be an option where they could contact a local uh, property owner and and, act, uh, and obtain an easement or a severance or something to get access. So they could, that could happen. But that's why I, I don't want to make those comments. I would possibly want to go to our planner, planner Benner, Benner is, is to make sure we're not making assumptions that you're making that could work. And there's ways of, of uh, if somebody was to buy it from the general public. So just on a general comment, uh, welcome, uh, Director Benner and and 
I, I'm sure you're listening. I, I just wanted to make sure there was some clarity to what Councillor Nielsen was asking, the possibility. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, through you to Councillor Nielsen's questions. Uh, when you look at the the way the property is laid out, it's it's certainly is a landlocked parcel. It does abut other parcels as well as the long, narrow kind of section that that comes into the land. Um, there, there is a there could be a let's say an opportunity to have that property adjoin other properties fronting on Gray Road Four. Um, certainly, it's it's most likely and and most valuable to to um, convey it with the, the land that's uh, the people that are asking about it. But there are other opportunities there that it could attach to other lands or have some sort of a uh, an easement across or, or something like that. Um, because it doesn't right now front a municipal road, it's, it's essentially undevelopable unless it merges with another property. Okay, um, thanks, Michael. Just hang on the line here, Councillor Nielsen. Does that help a little bit? Okay, do you have any further questions on that point? To okay, okay, thank you for that, uh, Councillor Allen. I think you were. Oh, Madam CEO, you popped up, so we take precedence. <laughs> <laughs> I I shouldn't take precedence over council, no, Mr. Mayor. No. Um, just procedurally, procedurally. Procedurally, I, that's thank you, thank you. I just wanted to add a little bit more of information so that that might appease uh, Councillor Nielsen. So when we go through a tax sale process, we essentially do closed bids. Um, that those um, advertisements state in there that any purchaser has the obligation themselves to do the due diligence on the property, um, that kind of buyer beware thing. Um, so all of that is mapped out. So we could definitely have terminology in there that could specify that the municipality will take no responsibility for, um, you know, um, title searches, uh, um, you know, they, they, the uh, bidder would have to do their own due diligence on it, basically. Okay, thank you for that clarity, Madam CEO. And, and I apologize, Councillor Allen, just Sometimes when the CEO pops up, she has more clarity to add to a, an item. So go ahead, Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, perhaps we could, instead of just putting it out in sealed for sealed bids, put it out to adjoining adjacent properties, um, because really that's the only people that would benefit from it. I, I don't, don't know if I agree with just selling it to the person that happened to ask because maybe others that adjoin would like to have that. But I, I do agree in the, in the point that Councillor Nielsen made that somebody sees that and bids um, high to get it and then finds out they can't do anything. Yes, it's buyer beware. They should do their due diligence, but um, still, it, um, it, it would be better if an adjoining property owner got that. So I'd be open to, to uh, changing it to an adjoining property. Just for clarity, I'm counting, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, five, is there five adjoining properties to that lot? We've got the long strip, the big piece at the back, and then there's three across the front. So that would be five, right? Okay, um, just a quick question also on uh, the hazard. Is there a hazard? Like I, that seems to be a low spot, is it not? I don't know what's, what's the zoning on it with regards to uh, the mapping of that, but uh, I'll just park that for now. Councillor Little. Thank you, Your Worship. Um... Just a question with regard to our policy around the sale of surplus land. Um, I guess is is our procedure now, or what we're doing in this case, that we're we first have to declare it surplus, and then we decide on how we would dispose of it. Um, I can get it clarity. Has, 
So I'm assuming it has no use to the municipality being landlocked, except that there may be a municipal road allowance there. I'm just, you know, we're talking about other situations and the reason why we have this policy is so that we're being fair and transparent and treating everyone equally. I know situations are different, but we had a situation um, on Windy Lane at the end of Windy Lane where there was a piece of municipal land and one adjacent property, the only adjacent property was interested in that. And we decided um, to keep it as municipal land. So I'm just wondering how, how these are different. Um, is it the value to the municipality is different? Um, and, you know, uh, so far what we've had to deal with since the policy is that um, it just goes on the open market and then whoever wants it can put a bid on it, I guess, make an offer. But um, I'm just not seeing how we're talking about this, that we're talking about it in a fair and equal way. If you, awesome. if that makes sense, I, I just... Um, Something about apples and oranges and bananas, right? <laughs> well, I just, I think if we make a decision without thinking about what yeah. we've done in the past and the reasons we've done those things in the recent past, since the, the um, since we have this policy, we just have to be careful. The whole reason we have a policy is to follow the policy so that, you know, uh, we're not criticized for, for, for treating people differently or special or anything like that. Everyone gets treated the same way. So just before I go to the clerk, so I guess the one question is you asked Council Whittle, does Council deem it surplus? Right? Do we deem it? Do we feel that we have a need for it? I mean, that's that's the first one. And if we don't, it removes all the other parts because we're not going to sell it. If we are determining that it is surplus and we do wish to uh, make, you know, dispose of it, then a policy lays out a process and that process is laid out, but council can make decisions against that or change that process. If we, I mean, council can, can do that, but we do have a policy laid out. So I guess the first question is you're asking council and others is, as the clerk has brought forward, is the recommendation is it is, it is surplus. That's the recommendations that is on our, our motion today. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Madam Clerk, but that is the position that you're bringing forward, correct? Uh, that's correct. So the first determination that council has to do when there's any indication of selling any municipal municipal land is determining is there any future need for this property um, or can it be declared surplus to municipal needs. Um, in the case of the one on Windy Lane, there wasn't that clear intent that it wasn't going to be required for future needs because of the potential for a subdivision in the back part of the property, those kinds of extenuating circumstances that could deem that the municipality may need that property at some point in the future. In this instance, uh, this landlocked parcel, uh, there doesn't appear to be any reason that the municipality would require this in the future, thus the reason for the recommendation to declare it surplus, which is the first instance that council has to decide whether or not they even want to proceed further. If council decides that they don't want to go any further with this, then they don't go any further with it. It is not declared surplus and the land remains in the hands of the municipality. In relation to um, the method for this um, that I, that I chose in the recommendation for this one, it was because of the fact that this property does abut to neighboring property owners. We wanted to maintain consistency with the policy and that fairness. Um, the policy does stipulate that we would be notifying the, the neighboring property owners um, for that. And I do like Councillor Allen's suggestion um, that we add something about it being to abutting property owners just to make that clear. So those are just the points that I wanted to make, but it is definitely council's decision about whether or not they think that this uh, land is surplus to the needs now or in the future of the municipality. Okay. Thank you for that clarity, Madam Clerk. Council, uh, anything to follow up to that, Councilor Little? I know you asked that question and that before I go to Councilor Nielsen. Uh, no, not at this time. Thank you, Your Worship. Okay, thank you, Councilor Nielsen. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to maybe the CAO who has in past, past also been our risk management individual. Um, 
I think one of the things to kind of keep in mind in terms of the uh, whether we want to keep this land or not. So we have a property owners who all abut to this land, and there's probably a few of them that um, might not have fencing or anything to, to decide what is okay, have I crossed over into the municipal land? Have I not crossed over to the municipal land? Am I in my own backyard? Am I in their backyard? Uh, and so, you know, when looking at this land, um, the landlocked nature of it, the fact that it's abutting to multiple different properties, um, you know, th is there a risk factor, that, that liability risk factor to property owners not knowing if they're actually on municipal lands at the time, probably not even understanding, you know, what portion of this becomes um, that public land and being that the municipality owns it, then technically it's public land. Um, and so they would all be allowed to use it. So uh, just because the first thing is to, dis to discover whether we deem this to be surplus or not, uh, Madam CEO, shortly, is there a liability issue with having this land in the middle of five uh, property owners? She'll tell you there's always liability, Madam CEO. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to Council and Nielsen. Um, so under occupier's liability, uh, any owner of land has a duty of care uh, to keep the property in reasonable, uh, safe condition. So the liability is on us as the landowners. If uh, somebody ventures off their property onto adjacent property, um, I, I don't see any liability on their part. Um, you know, the only thing I can think of off the top of my head, if it says no trespass trespassing, then, you know, they could be charged with a bylaw infringement for trespassing on other people's property. But other than that, I don't know of any liability issues. Okay. Councilor Nielsen, any follow-up before I go to Councilor Allen? Councilor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to make an amendment to the second part of the motion. Um, well, the third part, I guess, I guess there's three of them in there that we receive the report that we declare it surplus. And then the council direct that the disposition method for the property be by marketing by the municipality to adjoining properties. Okay. And accepting sealed offers would still be there? Yes. So, I think I thought there was five, but that probably would be five. Okay, so everybody clear of that? Councilor Nielsen, are you seconding that? Okay, so there's an amendment to the main motion. Uh, I just want to make sure that the clerk, oh, Councilor Little, I just want to make sure the clerk captured the motion, but Councilor Little? So my question is, are we, rem is Councilor Allen suggesting that we're, we remove the appraisal part or leave that in? That could be a separate motion, maybe. I, if, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, I think we leave it in. If that's in the policy, then, uh, and we're not supposed to sell for under appraised, then I guess we need to do that. Okay, so just to iterate that the uh, property be marketed by the municipality to the adjoining properties and accepting sealed offers. So I've added adjoining properties. Is that correct, Madam Clerk? Just want to. Make sure you capture that. Uh, yeah, so I had that council direct, the final one would be the council direct the disposition method for the property be by marketing by the municipality and accepting sealed offers from abutting landowners. Okay. So the, the resolution or the recommendation before council at the present time is that the main motion be amended by adding the words from abutting landowners to the end of the motion. Okay, so deputy, uh, sorry, Councilor Allen and, Dep and Councilor Nielsen, that's okay. Okay, thank you for that clarity. Councillor Little and then Councillor Alwood. So that's not quite clear to me. I mean, I know what you mean, but it could be misinterpreted. So marketing by the municipality to abutting landowners or just marketing in general? Madam Clerk, can you reiterate that motion? Um, it states by, mar by marketing by the municipality and accepting accepting sealed offers from abutting landowners. So we'd only be, we'd be marketing it and stating that we're only accepting sealed offers from abutting landowners. So basically your marketing is also to the abutting landowners in a way, right? Okay. Is that? Uh, so for, 
for openness and transparency, our marketing would include that it would be posted on our website and whatever else, but it would state that we're only accepting sealed offers from abutting landowners. Okay. All right. Uh, I think Councillor Allwood, you were next there, go ahead. Thank you, Worship. Uh, that actually cleared up part of my question, but I'm the uh, accepting offers from only abutting property owners, does that uh, violate our policy or is it in line with our uh, disposition policy? I presume that's to our clerk, Madam Clerk. Um, thank you for that question. So the our policy does state four different ways that we can uh, dispose of property. Um, and those are uh, direct sale for land exchanges with other levels of government or quasi-judicial, uh, marketing and accepting sealed offers. It doesn't say that it has that it can or cannot be um, from abutting um, landowners, listing with a real estate or public auction with minimum bid. So um, my interpretation would be because council direction has provided a clarity to one of the proposals in the policy. Okay, Councillor Allward, is that satisfactory? It answers the question. I just wonder whether, you know, if there's interested parties beyond the abutting landowners that they may consider themselves shut out of what should be a, an open bid. Yeah, I, I would say that from a transparency point, uh, they should be allowed only from the simple fact is, one though, if you purchase it, there's no way of getting there unless you fly there. And from an appraisal part, you won't be able to appraise it because you cannot, unless you have written permission from any of the abutting landowners to, to get there. So you, I guess there would be a way if there would be written permission. So your question is, should we shut out the general public? Could the general public put a bid on? I guess they could and then make a deal with or go approach one of the other neighboring properties to see if they could. That was my point. Could they seek a, a, an easement after they bought it. I don't know. Highly, probably the chances are, are low, but I don't know. Sorry, to, <laughs> I think I shouldn't have raised that part. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure that the information was available. Any thoughts on, on the other discussion on the motion that's on the, on the table uh, that uh, is, is reiterated by our clerk? Councillor Little, or Councillor Allen, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, item 8.3, the Kinburn Street Road Allowance, we're basically doing the same thing. We're taking mm -hmm. a road allowance and selling it to the property owners that are affected. So it's uh, something we have done and um, will do in the future if it um, seems the right way to go. Right. That's a good point. Madam Clerk, you popped up. Do you have a comment to that? Yeah. Um... So since we've established this policy, it was with the understanding that there is always going to be these one-offs. We have the policy, so the general public knows our general process for dealing with it and understanding that council has the ability to amend some of the things. So whenever anybody contacts me about um, purchasing property, which there is a number of inquiries regularly. Uh, we provide them with a copy of the policy. Um, and then when they ask the questions, if it's related to something it says there, I will let them know this is the policy. However, there may be extenuating circumstances and we will uh, circulate for comments and provide all relevant comments to council for their decision if they're going to maintain the policy or do an exemption to it. So uh, the public is aware that there is the, the possibility possibility. However, whenever possible, we want to make sure that the, the basis for our decisions is coming from that policy. And but still understanding that no two requests are ever going to be alike. Um, the one that um, Councillor Allwood just mentioned with the Kinburn Street Road Allowance, there's actually properties built on the land that we, we own. So there's, there's definitely always those considerations that have to be brought into play. Is that uh, satisfactory, Councillor Allen? Okay. Other questions? Okay, so the amendment is on the floor. Any further discussions on that amendment? Seeing none, all in favor of the amendment. That's carried. 
Okay, the main motion there as amended uh, does go back to Councillor Allen and the Deputy Mayor that originally moved that. That's what I have here. I thought it was Councillor Allwood. I have Allwood and Deputy Mayor. Oh, sorry. I, I thought you said Allen. I apologize. Maybe I did. Sorry. Yeah, so I, I got to read my writing. Yes, I got to write the whole. It's, it's short form. I'm doing uh, whatever you call that short form. Yes, Councilor Allwood and Deputy Mayor. I will write it out full next time. Thank you for that clarity. Um, yes, that the main motion is on the floor. Any further discussion on the main motion? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. All right. I think it's time for a quick break. <laughs> yes. 10 minutes. We've got 2.30. How about, can we be back by 2.40? Okay, we'll see you at 2.40.
240. <laughs> Um, Mayor McQueen, I just wanted to let you know that Deputy Mayor Desai contacted me to let me know that he would be uh, rejoining from a different device. So okay. he'll be in shortly. All right. Should we, how long do you take? Like a couple minutes? We can wait a couple minutes if he's rechanging his device. I, he messaged me. He messaged me right when we went into recess. So. Oh, Okay. Well, I know we have a big a big day here, and I want to make sure we keep moving along. Um, I'll give them I'll give them another twenty seconds, and then we'll start. All right, well, we'll hopefully the deputy mayor will um, catch up to us shortly here and I'm gonna call this meeting back to order at uh, 2.41 and the deputy mayor is changing devices so he may be a few minutes coming on. So moving on to our agenda then, uh, item 8.2, uh, natural uh, burial request overview for com comments received. And there is a report there, just I'm gonna pull it up here. So, Council Nielsen, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to move the option um, that uh, the council determines that the addition of the natural burial site in Great Highlands would be in public interest if all regulatory approvals have been attained and uh, that we grant the approval in principle at this time. Um, and I can, uh, after a seconder, I'll speak to this. So you're, you're moving the, the, the way it's worded on the agenda, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So, okay. So moved by Councillor Nielsen. Do I have a seconder? Oh, the Deputy Mayor is coming on, so we'll give that a few minutes. So do we have a seconder to move the report for discussion? Councillor Little. I'll second it for discussion, Your Worship, but I do have some concerns. Mm -hmm. Nope. That's, uh, that's fine. So Councilor Nielsen, you wish to speak to it? Go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor uh, and to Council. So um, the proponents who are making the request had a great uh, public information session um, that I did have the opportunity to attend. Um, one of the big, so all the big questions that are coming out from the, from the surrounding neighbors and from people who are uh, having questions and concerns about what's going on um, are very fair questions. And all we're saying today is that in principle, we are okay with the idea of a natural burial ground and that we are okay with learning more information along with the proponent. Um, the proponent has said they're going to do a hydrological study. They're going to have to do an environmental impact study. They're going to have to go through NEC. They're going to have to go through the conservation authorities. They're going to have to go through planning. So there's a lot of work to be done, but in order for them to start that process, they just need us to say, you know what, in principle, we're interested let's find out if you're even allowed to do it. So there's no saying here today that yes, you're approved, thank you very much. And we'll see you guys open for business in a little while. All we're saying is that uh, we're interested in seeing all the evidence come forward with your approval. The questions and comments being brought forward by the public are fair, but the only way we can answer those questions and comments from the public is by letting the proponent go ahead and get all the research done and do all the environmental impact studies and do all the information required. So this is why I think, to be honest, from my uh, perspective, there is nothing wrong with having a natural burial uh, site in Great Highlands, and I am okay with them going forward to get the information needed. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Councillor Nielsen. Uh, Cal I, I'm going to let the seconder speak to it first, and then I'll go to Councillor Allen if that's okay. Councillor Little, and then. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I lost my train of thought. I can go to Councillor Allen if you wish. No, I, I, I'm just collecting myself here. Um, this came to council and council was under no obligation to do any public um, consultation, but we thought that was fair. And um, we, wanted to, we wanted to understand if there was general support for a natural burial in the municipality of Grey Highlands. 
And we got, um, I think, a very good response um, generally. Mostly, uh, most of the responses were in favor of the idea of natural burial in the municipality. And I agree with Councillor Nielsen that understandably, um, neighboring properties have a lot of concerns about the, what the impacts may be. And neither council nor the residents have that level of understanding yet. That's, that, that would be included in the next steps. I guess my concerns are my questions, not more than, more than concerns. I think there is a level of support, um, but I'm not clear on the actual process um, what the municipal role is. So if we say today that we are uh, supporting in principle, it looks as if the NEC is leading that, that they would have to get a development permit. And I apologize to staff, I just haven't had time to digest everything and formulate my questions, but it does rely around process. Um, the letter that's included here from the NEC says that it, it, they would have to get a development permit first before the municipality could approve anything. So I'm wondering what is the, um, what was the, what is the regulatory role of the municipality? What is the consulting role of the municipality? So when the NEC uh, goes through their process for a development permit, they circulate everybody, does that include the municipality? And then when that um, permit, if the NEC does approve, does it then come back to Gray Highlands because there would be land use um, regulations that would have to be met, just like any kind of application? I'm just not clear um, because if it, what it says here is we're approving in principle um, that all relevant research studies and applications required have been completed and approved and provided to the municipality but that doesn't say in there that we actually approve of them or that it's met our requirements. So there's a bit of limbo here. Um, and, I, and so I, I hope my questions have come through in that rambling, <laughs> well, my rambling concerns, but I'm um, just not, I have to be clear what, what, our, um, what power we hold and what responsibilities we hold, thanks. Maybe go back to the clerk on that one, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Little. Uh, definitely. Uh, thank you, Councillor Little, um, for those questions. And I do understand them completely. There was a lot of research gone into this uh, re in relation to our role. And there was a lot of ambiguity in the beginning about how it happens, what the role is. It was, it was thought that in the beginning that they couldn't start with the BAO, so the Bereavement Authority of Ontario, until the municipality provided that approval. And that is, in fact, true. However, the approval that is here in principle does not go to the BAO, does not have any regulated authority in relation to the legislation. So we were finally able to receive confirmation from the BAO that the municipality does not have to provide their approval immediately, that they can wait until all the required NEC documents, all the planning, all the environmental impact, anything that's required for the land use of that property has been completed. So that was one big thing. That's why this resolution that's on here today is in principle. And why are we coming through with something in principle at this point in time? That's a good question as well. The reason being is because the amount of studies and the amount of planning applications, this is a two to three year project that the applicants are going to be embarking on. And so they just wanted a little bit of knowledge in the back of their mind that, you know what, in general, council believes that a natural burial site in Gray Highlands anywhere would be a good idea. If council does not believe that a natural burial site would be a good idea anywhere in Gray Highlands, they wouldn't pursue the rest of the information that they need to do. So all this approval is doing right now, and I tried to make that extremely clear in the recommendation that it is only in, in, in principle and that the municipality will only consider the final approval required by the BAO after we have received all those documents. So once they provide us all of those documents that they need, so their approvals from NEC, all of their uh, hydro 
geological studies, their environmental impact studies, anything that they had to do, they will provide them to us. At that point, another report will come to council with all of the information. And at that point, council will determine whether they're going to provide the approval or not. And that approval will be the one that goes to the BAO under the legis that's required under the legislation. So at this time, it really is just, do the, is there any merit in the proponents going forward with even looking into this further? Okay, thank you for that, Madam Clerk. Uh, Councillor Little, back to you again. Oh, sorry. sorry I, I didn't. I didn't answer the one question about the NEC. The NEC does circulate the municipality and all their development applications that fall within the realm. Um, we have received comments from um, Blue Mountains. They were circulated late on the applications. They only looked at it yesterday. They have provided a copy of the resolution, which I forwarded to all members of council, and I will attach that to the minutes. But they are also going to ask the NEC that they be included in the circulation if and when a development application goes through as well. We will automatically be included in the circulation. Um, as it would fall within our um, boundaries. So two follow-up questions, Your Worship. Go ahead. Um, so it does come back to Great Highlands for final approval. And I'm not sure of the, um, you know, what the um, public engagement process is for the other regulatory bodies. Could we, could we include with our approval in principle the comments we've received? from our public process. Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you. So I have been speaking with some members of the NEC um, uh, in, in going through this process as well. And I'll be happy to share with them a copy of this report, which includes all of the comments that we have received to date in our reply when they circulate us on the on the, if they get a development application. It's kind of um, early to send it through to them now when they don't even have a development application before them yet. Once we get circulated, I will reply and provide them with all of the comments from this report, as well as whatever resolution council decides on today. Right, and so, sorry, Mr. Mayor, just one last question then. When the NEC will circulate um, municipality that would come back on a council agenda? Um, I'll defer that to the planning department because they accept and circulate. Um, I know it does come to SMT. Um, I'm not sure on well, how. Could we make, could we make that request, Mr. Mayor, that um, that the that the NEC when the NEC circulates this uh, that it be brought to the attention. Of yeah, I can. Okay, I, I'm going to go to uh, as suggested to uh, Planner Benner for comments. Then, <clears throat> hopefully, you've been following along. So, do you understand Councillor Little's question? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was having a bit of interference. Could you be able to please repeat the question? <clears throat> so, Councillor Little, can you repeat that question, please? Um, well, my understanding, our understanding is that. The NEC would be, um, they would have to apply to the NEC for a development permit, and then the NEC would circulate various agencies, including the municipality. And my, my request would be that um, when that uh, information is shared with the municipality, sometimes it comes to council and sometimes it doesn't, and I would request that it come to council. Uh, thank you. And to you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Little. Uh, yes, we would be, as a municipality, a commenting agency with the Niagara Scarborough Commission Development Permit because the lands are wholly within the NEC area. Um, and certainly, uh, when we receive that, we will ensure that council is included in that circulation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk and, and Director Benner and Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, and thank you also. Okay, Councillor Allen, I got Deputy Mayor, and then Councillor Alden. Go ahead, Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So a clerk, or a question for the clerk. Um, when, if there's a cemetery, whether it's on a, a church property or uh, privately owned, I didn't realize private individuals could own cemeteries, but if for some reason it's abandoned or um, they want to give it up. I'm, I'm assuming that the municipality has a requirement to, or there is a requirement for the municipality to take it over. Is that correct? 
Madam Clerk, do you ever, do you, are you able to answer that question? I certainly am. Um, yes, that is a requirement under the legislation. Any cemeteries within our boundaries that become abandoned become the property of the municipality. In that regard, any care and maintenance funds that are in the holdings of that cemetery also get turned over to the municipality for the perpetual care of that of the, those lands. Um, if Generally, when cemeteries get abandoned, the municipality will not continue to operate them beyond that which has already been pre-sold. Um, because of the nature of a natural burial grounds, um, I don't anticipate there being pre-sales because there is not specific lots that are required um, to be allocated. Um, so that wouldn't, we don't, uh, we don't feel that that would be an um, an issue. Um, it's something that we would be flushing out uh, prior to that final report coming back to council after all of the approvals have gone through. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm just wondering if I, I, I haven't totally made my mind up on natural burials, but I think I have made my mind up on who should own them. And I, I think a cemetery should be owned and run by a municipality. Um, to have a private individual or corporation running a, a cemetery and taking money for perpetual care, and then the municipality perhaps having to take it over and are there finances there um, I'm sure there's rules as far as the money you take has to be set aside. Hopefully that is done. Um, I, I'm, I'm having trouble getting around a privately owned and run cemetery. Are you looking, is that more of a comment? versus a question I presume. Well, it's, it's, it's a comment to see what others think. Um, and so on that note, if if there if we feel that there is the desire from around the table to have a natural burial site in Grey Highlands, that's fine, but we shouldn't be giving the proponent hope if we end up saying, no, we're going to do it ourselves because there's going to have to be a lot of money spent um, before we even get to the point of saying, yes, we want you to do it. Um, so I think we need to decide fairly soon, do we want one? And second, do we want somebody else to run it or do we want to run it? Thank you. Okay, that's that's good food for thought for sure. Uh, Deputy, oh, did you have a comment, Madam Clerk? Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just in response to that in relation to the fees, um, I've dealt with a lot of different ministries and a lot of different um, government agencies in relation to regulations. The cemeteries. Uh, Act, the Funeral Burial Cremation Services Act, and the BAO is one of the highest heavily regulated bodies that I've ever dealt with. So not only do they require us to do our annual reporting, they are required to see updated financials from us every single year. They do math calculations and come back to us if we are off by a single percentage on what's supposed to be in the accounts. We are required within 60 days to when there's any sale of lands to put those in there. And regardless of whether the cemetery is owned and operated by a municipality, by a church organization, or by a private entity, all of the rules are the same. Okay. I don't know if you have a follow-up to that, Councilor Allen, before I go to the Deputy Mayor. Um, um, just, just a quick one. That That's fine that they do require accounting, but if they do an accounting on June 1st of 2021 and the money's there and they do another one on June 1st of 2022 and the money's not there and the people have left. And, and I'm not, I, I don't know the people that have, uh, that are suggesting a, this site, but if the money's not there and they're gone, it's gone. 
and then the municipality has to step in, not only run it, but care for those um, sites for forever, um, I'm assuming. So uh, just, just I don't think it's quite as simple as saying, yes, we want one and let them go to it kind of thing. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Mayor McQueen. And welcome back. Yeah, I'm, I'm in a warmer room now, so uh, my toes aren't freezing off. Uh, <laughs> and I'm doing it off a computer now. It's, it's a completely different uh, interface. Um, to respond to Councillor Allen, I, I don't have an opinion on natural burial. Um, how, how, um, how people choose to have their end-of-life services done is up to them. Um, quite frankly, um, it's, it's, it's a service that's provided. It's a service that's legal. Um, so I, I don't see an issue with that. In terms of if it is in public interest, um, my question would be, what's the current status of, of cemetery plots in Grey Highlands? We have, we did receive quite a few um, positive comments. We've also received a few negative ones um, on it. Um, at the end of the day, I, I think, the negative comments that we received, a lot of them were with regards to the uh, to the issues around uh, the the water aquifers, uh, the um, how they intended on on ensuring that the bodies were in fact uh, uh, preserved and not not made open to to uh, natural uh, forces. Um, in fact, there was one which which uh, specifically mentioned that they were worried that. Uh, with only a two meter depth, um, that the uh, the frost could cause the body to be exposed to natural um, natural forces. Uh, but I'm hearing from the clerk that basically that would be decided. The effects on on uh, water systems and so on would be would be decided through through uh, processes from the NEC, the uh, the FBCS, um, or not the FBCS, but the NEC and another um, regulatory bodies. Uh, so to me, this sounds like it's it's the first reading of a bill in legislature, which you know we're we're basically saying you know y yeah it's it's I mean it's an idea um, whether good or bad would obviously objectively depend on whether or not it how on on how it affects the uh, the properties around it and and so on. So um, I I don't think. Um, it's it's necessarily wrong or or, or um, a danger for for a for a private entity to be involved in the cemetery business to, uh, to Councillor Allen's fear of the person running away. Um, we live in an age where um, last week there was a, a news article where Hamilton police worked with police in Hungary to to. Um, uh, nab for the lack of a better word a murder suspect so we live in a very connected world and people can be found um if, if they need to be brought to justice so uh, again this is not a comment on the on the applicant or or the idea itself but i think this is more of a first reading and i feel like i've rambled on but this is more of a first reading of a bill in the legislature and, and i i think i could support uh, supported going forward so that it can be explored further on what the effects of it would be on, on neighboring property. Okay, thank you for that, Deputy Mayor. I didn't see a question, more of a comment there. So I'm moving on to Councillor Alwit. Thank you, Worship, through you, Council. The um, concern I have with this is uh, it relates to, uh, you know, the, the Niagara Escarpments Commission's correspondence that said it would be premature for Council to make any decisions. I'm wondering why we're not deferring this uh, as one of the options. Uh, uh, what it, a deferral is one of the options that was presented. The other thing is that uh, I've um, received some information that the, you know the uh, some of the interest in the some of the information in this report was not available uh, before the deadline for public comments. So the concerns of the abutting property owners are. Uh, there are concerns with the abutting property owners. And the, uh, 
the way the way the uh, <clears throat> motion is presented right now, it says that the council grants approval in principle. And I know that's not a final approval, but it, it is a uh, it is some sort of decision. And I think that um, it's premature, as the uh, Scarpman, uh, Niagara Scarpman people have, have said. So my question really is, why aren't we deferring this? I, that's a question to all of council, I guess, in a sense. Um, yes. I, I will say that, uh, yeah, that, that there is those comments in there from the NEC, and, and before anything can happen, there has to be a development permit in place prior to any decision or anything. They, they do have the their authority, the jurisdiction that has the authority, right, mm -hmm. on that part. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I just have one final comment, which sort of relates to what Councillor Allen was talking about. That uh, you know, the concept of natural burial, whether you uh, agree or disagree with it, it seems like uh, an area within our existing cemetery might be a better location. And apparently, some other municipalities are doing that. But uh, um, certainly, the municipality of Grey Highlands manages cemeteries and knows how to do it effectively. Thank you. Okay. Just the, the one point of clarity I, I, I want to raise to council is because the motion says grants approval in principle, um, I think with your comments, Councilor Elwood, if it's deferred, it's not, council's not making a decision, but if this motion was to lose, is that going to be a double negative at that moving forward versus uh, the municipality of Grey Highland supports it moving forward to the next stage? Does that does that soften it a bit so it still allows it to move forward, but then it doesn't hold the municipality as strong in position in the sense, if that's the concern I'm hearing, I don't know. Councilor Allred and then others, I just sold it out for information. Sure. No, I, I guess I'm asking why we're not uh, taking option C in the staff report deferral, which should council prefer to wait until the applicant has obtained a development permit prior to making a decision on public interest? So the motion that's on the floor is this. Certainly an amendment can change the main motion if you wish. I can I can go to Councilor Little and, and you can think about that, Councilor Allard, if you wish. Councilor Little? The question that Council was asked was, would, it, would this be in the public interest? And that's why we went out and circulated. Um, not that we had to, but we did. The response we got, as I said, was very positive. Um, except for some concerns, which are understandable from neighboring property owners. And so uh, my opinion would be that, um, yes, it's a lengthy process for the applicants, um, very stringent. And before they embark on that long process, they would like some level of assurance that this council thinks that this proposal is in the public interest. And that's all we're really being asked for. So um, I can understand why we, um, and I would support making a decision today, not deferring um, that we, we could support in principle that this is in the public interest. Um, conditional, you know, we've put in conditions um, because, and we're not undertaking all these um, studies and reviews. So um, I guess to answer Councillor Allwood, um, it's, it's a benefit to the applicant and the applicant requested um, if the municipality deems this to be in the public interest. And I think the re response we got indicates that it is in the public interest. That was my interpretation. Okay. I go back to Councillor Allwood and I get Councillor Allen and we've been at this for half an hour <laughs> or more. Again, you know, the NEC is, has stated it's premature for Council to make any decision. Um, I, I think the decision that natural burial is in the public interest is, is one, one aspect that doesn't necessarily mean that this is the right location for it or that a privately owned natural burial cemetery uh, 
in the Niagara Escarpment region is, is, is the right location. So approving it in principle, the deputy mayor likened it to the first reading of, of a bill or bylaw. So it, it, it does, I think, give, at this point, in my opinion, um, the implication that we're approving it I guess it says in principle, but um, I, I would, I would, I would uh, think that um, a deferral pending more information, specifically the Niagara Escarpment concern, be addressed. Thank you. And you're and you're putting that emphasis on option C. I just pulled it up here. I come back to you. Uh, so I got Councillor Allen, Deputy Mayor, and then I think maybe Councillor Little again, and we're getting. Quite a few comments on the same subject from each individual, but go ahead, Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, another question for the clerk. Can we do natural burials now in Gray Highlands in our existing cemeteries? Okay, I'm not sure if she's able to answer that, but I'll, I'll ask her. Of course she can. Yes, I can answer that. No, we can't. <laughs> So in order to do anything new in any of our cemeteries, we have to go to the BAO, we have to get approval um, through all of their processes, we have to update our bylaws, we have to update our fee structure, we have to update all that stuff, and they have to provide approval on the location and everything that we have to do. So we have to provide site plans, we have to provide all of that kind of stuff. We are only permitted to do uh, regular burials and cremation uh, burials at our cemeteries, and uh, we're only permitted to do our columbariums in the locations that they have approved. Okay, thank you for that. There you See? Go. <laughs> okay, so then I would like um, the question to be split into two halves. So the, that we receive and that we determine it, that it's in the, would be in the public interest. Those two I would like as one motion and then the next two could be another motion unless somebody wants it split even more. Okay, so procedurally, uh, right now I have a motion from Council Nielsen and Council Little for all three. Madam Clerk, help me out if somebody asked to split it after the motion is on the floor. Uh, where do I assign or do I go back to the mover and seconder? Like, how do how, what's the process here when we have three points of this? How do we, if it's already on the floor and the question's asked? Uh, a, a request to split a motion can happen at any time when the motion is on the floor and the mover and, a, and the seconder remains from the full motion will remain the same oh. for each of its separate parts. Oh, okay. That makes it simple. All right. So the first part that council determines that the addition of a natural barrier site in Gray Highlands would be in the public's interest if all regulation, all regulatory, all regulatory approvals have been obtained. So that's moved by Council Nielsen, second by Council Little. Sorry, Discussion on that part. Sorry, and the first part, the council receives staff report. So the first two would be in the first motion. And then the last two, there's four sections actually. Well, maybe I'm looking at the wrong one here that I'm looking at what's on the agenda, not in the You report. just missed the first so, clause, Your Worship. The council receives okay, so staff report CLS oh, 2122. Right, 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 right. I, yeah, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> right. Okay. Gotcha for the clarity of this. Yeah. Okay, so that's the first part. Thank you for that clarity, Councillor Allen. All right, discussion on that first part. Any questions on that first part? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? That's correct. Okay, so first part. So then I'm presuming the next part is the next paragraph. So who would like to move that part? Um, if you wish. Sorry, Your Worship, those each oh yeah part. same part same yeah yeah yeah, yep. yeah. and i believe councillor allen requested that the final two be joined together as well so we just split the four into two of two okay so i'll read that then so moved by councillor nielsen second by councillor little that the council of municipality grounds grants approval in principle only at this time for a natural burial site to be located on the property known as 
355310 Blue Mountains or Fraser Town Line, conditional on obtaining approval from the Negro Escarpment Commission and in any other regulatory body required, except BAO, and that council will only consider final approval as required under section 84 in brackets one of the Funeral, Burial, and uh, Cremation Services Act 2002 after all relevant research studies and applications required have been completed and the approval and, and approval and provided to the municipality. And that's been moved by Councilor Nielsen and, and Councilor a little discussion. Councilor Allen and Councilor Little. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm thinking that, um, as I said earlier, that I feel that um, if we're going to have a natural burial site, it should be run by the municipality. So the reason I wanted this split was to um, not give the proponent um, or, or not require them to do all the studies if, if we're not moving in that direction of, of allowing them to do it. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Little and then Deputy Mayor. Um, I have an amendment, Your Worship. Okay. Uh, let me see here. That the um, remainder of this motion be amended by adding the, or I guess it's the whole motion be amended by adding the clause that any NEC development application comment request related to a natural burial in Gray Highlands be included on the council agenda. So the NEC comment request be included in an upcoming Council agenda? Well, the appropriate council agenda. Okay, an appropriate council agenda. Do I have a seconder for that amendment? Councilor Allen. So let's move by Councilor Little, second by Councilor Allen. We're speaking to the amendment. Madam Clerk, were you able to capture that? Okay. All right, discussion. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor McQueen. My question is uh, with regards to the wording, what's the, what's the difference, so to speak, between determining that a natural burial site in Gray Highlands would be in the public interest and granting approval in principle? Uh, what's the difference between those two? Thank you. Who would like to address that? Councillor Holy. Maybe you're going to cancel a little. Bit Sorry, my, my question through you was to the clerk. I, I apologize. I was, I was, it was not a, it was not a, <laughs> it was not a debate. It was more of a, is there an official definition difference between the two? Sorry. Just a, a question of clarity, Your Worship. Your, your question of clarity is? So I don't know how this relates to the amendment. Maybe we'll hold that off. I think I will. I will hold off. Yeah, it's sort of the general right. Uh, I will grant that for sure. So we're just speaking about the amendment with regards to the AC comments will be added to an appropriate uh, council agenda. On that discussion point, other is your discussions on that point of that amendment? Moved by Councilor Little, seconded by Councilor Allen. All in favor of that amendment? Okay, that's carried. The main motion has been amended. Deputy Mayor, I will go back to you because you were asking that question on the main, main motion. Thank you, Mayor McQueen. Uh, my question for you to the clerk is with regards to what the difference in, in definition is between determining that it, it would be in public interest as opposed to granting, a, uh, granting approval in principle only at this time. Okay, Madam Clerk. <laughs> uh, thank you. So I think your question is relation to clause two versus clause three um, of the original motion from the agenda. So clause two is stating that, you know what, we do think that it would be in the public in interest if all the regulation, all the approvals came through. Clause three is specifically saying for this property who is the requester at this time, 
we're saying that we're going to give you approval in principle because we do think it's in the public interest for Gray Highlands. However, we're only giving it to you in principle because until we get all of these things, site specific things, we're not giving you any final determination. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So following up on that, then I, I think one of Councillor Allwood's fears was that we would be giving them uh, an approval effectively. Uh, I, I should imagine after watching this, the, the video of this meeting, the, uh, the applicant would be very clear that it's not a blanket approval. Uh, there, there is some conditions that are, and, and I would argue fairly stringent conditions. Um, so um, I, I I'm still struggling to see that there is a, a significant difference between the two clauses, but that's that's beyond um, that's beyond debate at this point. But I, I don't uh, I don't see an issue with with uh, the approval in principle only. I think it's it's made abundantly clear uh, through the uh, motion on the agenda itself, as well as through the debate that you know if if, if the um, uh, reports that come back from uh, the NEC and, and other regulatory bodies are not satisfactory and that there is evidence that such a, uh, a land use may in fact uh, negatively affect the uh, water quality for, for the properties around, then we would uh, rescind the, uh, the approval in principle, which is only, or that we would not uh, consider a final approval if, um, if, if these conditions aren't met. So I think... Uh, if we've determined that it is in the public interest, I, I think this, and I don't want to use the word a foregone conclusion, but I, I think there is very little debate to be had on, on this. Okay. I'm going to go to Councillor Allwood next. Councillor Allwood. So two things. One, the Deputy Mayor's uh, question, you know, I, I believe that the third clause in the original amendment, uh, original motion is specific to that location. I'm also going back to the NEC's letter that says it would be premature for council making any decisions or granting any approvals, whether it's in principle. So the NEC is advising us not to make this um, approval in principle, any approval. I, I share Councilor Allen's you know, I, I, I was in favor of deferral, but I'm almost thinking now Councillor Allen wants to give the proponents some clear direction before they undertake a fairly uh, onerous task of, of getting the necessary reports and uh, studies done. But um, I still believe it's premature for the for uh, council to make any any approval, including one in principle. But if, if the motion goes forward as, as, as it stands right now, I guess we're gonna vote yes or no. And uh, well, that's sort of like the it's sort of, it's either supporting in principle or not. I guess if it failed, a separate motion could come forward that changes that direction or however, but Madam Clerk. Um. Respectfully, I'm going to disagree with Councillor Allwood. The wording of the legislation that the NEC um, quoted is providing approval, consent, or permission to do stuff on the land. An approval in principle does not provide approval, consent, or permission for them to do anything on the land. All it gives them is peace of mind to go forward with studies. And I can iterate that that has happened before. That has been that has happened before. That in principle doesn't tie a municipality in place. It just says at this point we're okay with moving forward, but we're not securing the decision yet until the NEC makes that decision. So, Councillor Little, we just, uh, just sorry, uh, Councillor sorry, Councillor Allen, did you have a follow up? That I'll come back to you. I you were, you were sort of sorry. Uh, I, Thank you, Your Worship, through you to the clerk. I, uh, I was quoting you know, from page 26 of the report, where, which was the final page of the NEC's letter. Um, I wasn't looking at the, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have the regulations in front of me or the intimate knowledge that the clerk has of those regulations. So I, uh, that was where I got my interpretation from any approval. Thank you. I'll use a, a quick example. 
if there was a severance process on the NEC, this is where I've had experience. If there's been a severance that the, the council could say, yeah, we approve it in principle, but we cannot approve it until the NEC says, yes, there can be a severance or however the, and, and then it can come back to council. So I've experienced that part before, if that helps in the sense of process. Um, Councilor Little. And I was going to say something similar to your worship that um, that last paragraph in the NEC letter does say that it's premature for council to be making decisions, but we're not. We're really just saying that we, we approve in principle and it's all conditional on the NEC. It's not, you know, it's, um, I think that this is stating more that we can't preempt the NEC and go ahead and say we, we approve it. Um, it's conditional on their approval and we are just um, expressing our support for the idea. Okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. And, and then, we, uh, then we have to move on. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you, Mary McQueen. And I'd just like to point out that the NEC, the letter from the NEC does not mention um, uh, that it would be premature for council to uh, to make any decisions, grant any approvals, conditional or otherwise. It simply says uh, that it is premature for council to be making any decisions or granting any approvals on this proposal prior to the NEC considering the proposed development through a development permit application. So we're effectively saying that if the NEC um, uh, considers this uh, favorably, then council, council would consider the final approval favorably. That is all we're saying. Uh, I think it's, um, it's incorrect to suggest that they said it's, it's um, premature to, to grant a conditional approval as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I want to put this to vote. Is there any new information that hasn't been said? If not, I'm, I'm going to move forward here then. And, and again, uh, this is the second part of the split out question. Uh, I'm not going to read it again as I have read it out and the amendment was read out itself. It was moved by Councilor Nielsen, second by Councilor Little. And your position on this um, motion. In favor? Okay, uh, opposed? Okay, I'm gonna do this again because I uh, I left, I held off. So all those in favor? Opposed? That motion's carried. And just to reiterate, uh, iterate is that it's in principle, Madam Clerk, but it does not hold counsel to any but uh, regulatory authority of giving permission to move. It's it's just. That's correct. We will not be forwarding any of this to the BAO. You yeah. will make a different decision as related to the legislative authority uh, at a future council meeting after all of these, which could be two to three years from now, and it could be a new council. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. So moving on then to uh, item 8.3. Um, uh, Kilburn, Kil Kilburn Street Road Allowance. Okay, the resolution is there. I always like to go to council. Is somebody interested in moving the motion that is there or is what you wish, council? Councilor Little, are you moving the motion that's written or? I'll move your worship. Okay, do I have a seconder? Councilor Allwood? Okay, discussion. <clears throat> um, I can read it out. I'll read it out once. Uh, moved by Council Little, second by Council Allwood, that Council receives staff report CLS 2124 King Burn Street Road Allowance, and that Council agree in principle that the option laid out in the illustration in illustration two and direct staff to proceed with the processes required to give effect to the option, and that Council agree to waiver the, the fee associated with the planning application required to fulfill the intent of illustration two, and that council direct staff to continue discussion around the remaining road allowance. Any comments, discussion from council? Oh, and seeing none, all in favor. That is carried. Okay, 
Okay, going on to item 8.4 with regards to a noise bylaw exemption request hospital build. Does anybody care to move the motion that has been written? Deputy Mayor, Councillor uh, Allen. All right, move by Deputy Mayor to decide, second by Councillor Allen that the request, uh, sorry, the council receives staff report CLS 2126 noise exemption request, hospital build, and that council. Okay, was that for approval or deny? Deputy Mayor? Approval, your worship. Okay. That council approve the request for construction at the new Markdale Hospital site to commence at 6 a.m. for the months of July and August. And I think it's in the report because of the warmer weather that gets started earlier. Discussion. Do anything I'll add for information to council a number of years back, um, Highway 10 south of uh, Flesherton, we allowed an exemption for the highway construction to start earlier as well. I can't remember which year that was, but uh, council at the time did, did allow an exemption for that project. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried, okay. All right, curbside uh, waste collection contract extension. There's a suggested resolution there. Would somebody care to move it or have something different? Councillor Allwood, do you move that? You're, you're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry, Sorry you. I, I did declare a uh, pecuniary interest, so I'm going oh, yes. to. That's right. I apologize. Yep, Allwood, declare. Okay, so please remove yourself from the screen. Councillor Nielsen, are you moving this? And Councilor Allen is seconding it. All right, moved by Council Nielsen, second by Councilor Allen. The council received staff report ENV 2101 regarding curbside waste collection contract extension, and that council waived the purchase and tendering administrative policy, and that council support an 18 month extension to the existing contract with Wilton Sanitation for the collection of curbside garbage and refuge removal. Uh, from the municipal transfer station from July 2021 to December 31st, 2022, and that council supports a 5% increase to the curbside collection, and Councillor Allwood has declared a conflict of interest. Discussion. Any discussion there? All right, seeing none, all in favor of that? That is carried. Councillor Allwood, you can come back now. Okay, moving on to 8.6, closing an, uh, an unopened portion of Albert Street between Allen Street and Margaret Street. Does somebody care to move that motion that's on the agenda or something different? Oh, we have Councillor Little, you're moving that? And Councillor Allen, you're seconding that? Okay, Councillor Allen, did you have a question to that? Um, well, I will want to discuss some things, but I just, you know, just get it on the table to start the discussion. Okay. So moved by Councillor Little, second by Councillor Allen, that staff report PU 21-11, closing of an unopened portion of Elbert Street, extending between Ellen Street and Margaret Street be received, and that the Director of Public Utilities and the Director of Transportation and Open Spaces arrange a meeting with the owners of lot one and five, lot G, plan number 39, uh, and the owners of lot six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, block G, plan number 39, to review the status of a prior notice provided by the municipality require, requiring that the owners of lots one and five locate a well on their own property and cease using an old private well, which was located without the consent or agreement of the municipality of Perry Highlands or its predecessor, the village of Flesherton, on the unopened portion of Albert Street road allowance between Allen and Market Streets, and that staff report back to council following the meeting with the above landowners to review comments received and further direction. Okay, Councillor Allen, you wish to speak to that motion? Um, okay, I'll start. This has been going on a long time. 
Um, I think the original um, letter was 2006. So we're talking 15 years. Um, there's, it, it seems like we're, we're allowing public pressure, uh, those people that are on the well to control um, what council does or doesn't do. So I think we need to be serious about this and figure out who is on that well and be clear that they need to drill their own well or make other arrangements. And um, we, I, I, halfway through my, my talk here, I, I just, just one question on the wording. Closing of an unopened portion of Albert Street. So what are we talking about there to be, so we're all clear? It's already closed because it's never been opened. So are we talking about um, um, declaring it surplus or what, what's, why was that terminology used? Okay, so this is from the public utilities director as well I'm reading this from or from a does um, is Sean here able to answer that or, or if not um, the director of transportation or, or somebody. So I'm here. Uh, this report, uh, as Councillor Allen said, has been ongoing for uh, quite a while. Uh, this report was actually done back when Carolyn Stobo was with the municipality and backfilling for Debbie Robertson. So we just pulled that report after we were brought to our attention about a couple of users using that well still and found that it hadn't actually went to council for a decision. So that's why it's here and it's worded that way. So in her report, I think it talks about her finding a report that did go to council in roughly 2014. And in that report, it said about closing the unopened road allowance, I believe, and then disposing of it. But then this report kind of come after once staff were looking into it and thought, well, maybe the best idea isn't to get rid of the road allowance, it's to deal with the well and then keep the road allowance there uh, in case it is needed in the future. Okay, and uh, thank personal, you for that. Uh, personal privilege, personal privilege, Your Worship. So, okay. Somebody's, some people's mics are open and um, I'm having trouble listening to the speaker and hearing the background noise. So if those people could turn their mics off, please. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have any background noise here. So, um, yeah, thank you for, yeah, uh, for that, Councilor. I was getting, I was hearing some as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Sean, and, and I don't know if Herb has anything else to add before I go back to Council Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and just to add to what Sean's mentioned, terminology of un, unopened, unmaintained, closed uh, right-of-ways are always difficult to understand, and, and um, a little training that I've had just recently, it's proper terminology, and, and uh, uh, currently the, the, the Albert Street right-of-way is unmaintained. <laughs> Uh, nobody maintains it, but there's full access. By closing the right of way, the municipality chooses that no future development can go there unless it is deemed um, excess lands, and then you can go about that way. Uh, to my knowledge, right now, we only have one closed road allowance by a bylaw, and that is uh, um, side road four uh, between uh, seventh concession and, and down into the Kimberley. Uh, the valley so just just terminology it always uh always catches me anyways but uh, sean's report is is accurate in our recommendation to close it for public use okay oh we got an addition here madam clerk <laughs> um just from the legislative point of view so all road allowances are determined to be road allowances unless they're closed and that terminology comes straight from section 26 of the municipal act so a municipality if they want to permanently close a road allowance so that it is no longer deemed a highway of the municipality, they are required to close such road allowance. And that is so, the exact terminology from the Municipal Act. 
So unless closed, they're deemed as a highway. Uh, and, and thank you, uh, 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 Director of Transportation Herb as well. Going back to you, Councillor Allen, I think you got the one, two, three. Uh... Yeah, okay. So I'm clear on closing an unopened portion. Okay. Um, so the, I think most of council, if probably all of council is aware that there's, there are pipes going from that um, well across the property that is being proposed, um, uh, proposed development on. So this does need to get sorted out, um, obviously before they start to, to develop those uh, lots um, seven, eight, nine and 10, no, eight, nine and 10, I believe. Um, so I, I guess I just feel that we need to really move forward on this and, and get it sorted out. Um, I, I think I would have liked to have seen um, declaring that road allowance surplus and totally getting rid of any liability there. But um, I guess staff has a reason why they feel we may need it in the future. Um, so um, I think those are my comments for now. And certainly, Councillor Allen, there are other processes of you know, that you can go through on that as well, whether a notice of motion or other things that you could go through on that as well. Just, just before, okay, I got, I, got, I got a comment that from, from some historical matter that came to council, but I'll hold off on that. Councillor Alwyn. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Worship, through you to council. The uh, open forum comments today from uh, Lucas Oldfield. I mean, that, that that's another option that we could consider. And he is, he is the owner of record of those lots, I believe. Um, so yes. that, uh, that would give him a nice block of lots and property that a plan of subdivision could be put forward. And uh, anyways, um, I, I just wanted to make sure all of council was aware of that. But uh, in that case, I guess it would be a disposition. We, we would have to declare a surplus and and sell the property, but uh, right. Thank you. I, I think there. If I don't want to put words in in uh, Director Moyer's um, uh, mouth, but I think there's also a concern of understanding how many people are on that well as well. As I recall, there's there's a, maybe that understanding that needs to be sorted out possibly as well. And and um, and I and I just going back to that open forum. Lucas Oldfield said he would be available if council wishes to have, if they had any questions from his perspective on that as well. So I think he said he would be listening. And so I just wanted to, to remind everybody that. So councilor, did, I, did somebody else have a question before I go back to councilor Allen? Okay, I'll go back to councilor Allen. Thank you. Um, yes, the, um, when Mr. Oldfield was speaking in open forum, did I hear correct that he was willing to assume legal implications? I forget exactly the wording he used, but I'm, I would, I'm assuming he was talking about the mm -hmm. users that are on that well that um, shouldn't be. I, I did write down the word. I tried to write, I wrote down assuming. I did write that down from my notes I was capturing from him. Well, he did say he'd like to yeah. assume the property, but I, there was also something about the legal implications or something. So um, maybe that's something we can clarify. Right. Well, if you want to clarify it, I mean, he said he was going to be available if council wishes to the process of allowing him on, but we can park that for a minute. Uh, I got other comments, maybe other people. I got Sean popped up, so maybe Sean has. I'll let Sean go, and then I'll go to Councilor Little and Councilor Little. Just a comment on the well property. I think part of the reason that this is on here now is to try and get that well cleared up before anything else happens on that property. With a well, uh, whether it's on municipal property or not, if there's five or more users on it, and it is not being treated to the Ministry of Environment standards, then it would then default or could possibly default back to the municipality. 
So uh, staff's thought on this one is that if we deal with the well now and, and get find out how many users are on it and let them know their options are like either to be disconnected or to drill their own wells and see what their feelings are and then bring those back to council at that time and then council can make that decision whether the well will be stopped up and closed or if it is to be brought up to a municipal standard or, or what needs to be done and if there's only four then maybe then it's a, an easier decision but uh, if there's five or more, it could get very costly for anybody that's connected to it or whoever could possibly assume the that well or that property. So I think it, it's in the municipality's or staff's best interest to find out who's on it, how many are on it, and then bring back those options to council to make a decision on what they need to do. Okay. I got Councillor Link Sean. I got Councillor Little and then Councillor Elwood. Yeah, I was just going to say basically what Sean said that um, the direction here in the uh, motion is to just to direct staff to arrange a meeting and then come back to council with more information. We obviously don't have enough information. Um, and I don't know how helpful uh, hearing from Mr. Oldfield would be um, if staff is going to be having conversations with those property owners anyway. So um, I think we can we can vote on what what the uh, what the motion is stating. Okay, thank you, Councillor Little. Councillor Allwood, did you indicate you wish to speak or no? I'm not. If you don't, I just I thought maybe you did. Uh, I did have my hand up, but I'll I'll uh, take it down. Thank you. Okay, just before I put this to vote, um, I remember, and maybe Sean can help me here. I remember something coming to council. And there was a discussion about some people and, and what would they do and would they have to do a different well. I don't know if, if Councillor Allen, if that was 2010 to 14 or if that was Deputy Mayor and Councillor Little, that was 14 to 18. I don't know if anybody else remember. I just remember something coming and, and you know, they were concerned, well, you know, does that mean I got to drill another well? How am I going to do that? Does anybody remember that, Councillor Allen? Do you remember something about that? Yes, um, I actually had a, a an accepted offer on that piece of property. I made an offer on that to purchase that property, and I went to the neighbors um, just to explain what I was thinking about doing, and that prompted one of the adjacent property owners that does draw water from that well to delegate to council. And that's what got this all going again. But that was back um, probably six or seven years ago. I just remember something and there was concern and how am I going to pay for that and the number of things that were raised at that council meeting. So, okay, thank you for that clarity. Okay, so the motion has been read. It's moved by Councillor Little, second by Councillor Allen. Any further conversations in the sense of points of order? If not, all in favor of that motion. Okay. Oh, yep, that's carried. Unanimously. Yeah, okay. So moving on then to 8.7 with regards to the fire communication paging antenna on top of the Markville water tower. Does somebody care to move that motion? Yep, Nielsen, Councillor Little, or Sir Allen. Moved by Council Nielsen, seconded by Council Allen, that Council received staff report PU 21-12 regarding a fire communication paging antenna on the Markdale Water Tower and that Council supports the installation of an antenna as part of the Gray County-led Enhanced Fire Radio Communication System Project. Any discussion? Seeing that, all in favor? That's carried. All right, uh, item point 8.8, .8, uh, in public input, Raglan Street Extension in Eugenia. Uh, there's a suggested resolution there or two. Um, Councilor Allen. Um, I'll read it for you, Mr. Mayor, then maybe you don't have to do it. <laughs> the council received staff report TES 21.05 and the previously submitted report, PL 21.55 Raglan Street Extension Request for Information, 
and that council accept the request to a partial extension of Raglan Street as substantially contained in report PL 21.55. Okay, and that's where you're stopping, so you're moving that. Councillor Allwood, are you seconding that? I second that, Your Worship. So that saves me reading it. You guys need to do that more often. <laughs> All right, discussion. Any discussion on that part? Uh, I see none. All in favor of that motion? Opposed? Is that opposed, Deputy Mayor, or in favor? It's in favor? Okay. In favor. So that's, that's carried unanimous. That's carried. Mm -hmm. All right. Maybe there's just a little delay in that uh, internet there, maybe. Okay, moving on. Uh, 8.9, 20, so Museum and Heritage Advisory Com uh, Committee approved minutes. There's some recommendations there. Councillor Little. You're on mute. Okay. I'd like to move that Council receive the Museum and Heritage Advisory Committee 2021-05-21 unapproved minutes. And that council receive the recommendations from MHAC related to providing signage for the pioneer communities in the former township of Euphrasia, and that these recommendations be taken into consideration in a municipal signage hierarchy report that will be presented to council no later than the fall of 2021, and that these recommendations related to signage for pioneer communities in the municipality be included for council consideration in the 2022 municipal budget. And I did provide the, uh, provide the wording to the clerk. I think she's put it in the chat. Yeah, because I was reading along and said, that's totally different than what's on the motion. <laughs> Madam Clerk, did you capture that from being sent prior? And if you can. Uh, yes, Mayor McQueen, it is in the chat for so council can see it. Okay. Can you just put it on the screen just for our viewing public, just to see that because it wasn't our published and then, then we'll take it down for discussion and we'll have discussion. Um, you're going to have to give me a minute. I have 18 screens open. So okay. Just give I'll me go, one second. <laughs> I just want to make sure the public sees it, but I'll go through questions and I'll come back to you. Okay. So that motion has been moved. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Allwood, are you seconding that? I am your worship. Okay. Councilor Nielsen, you want to speak to it? Just a question for clarity for uh, members of the museum uh, board group. Um, the signs we're talking about, the blue signs that kind of run through the municipality. Uh, we have signs for, I think it's like Cheeseville um, and, and things like that. Is that the kind of signs we're talking about or are we talking about um, more uh, in-depth or fancy signs. I was trying to get on and watch the meeting, but unfortunately I didn't have time. Okay, and I'm gonna go to uh, Councillor Little, who moved the motion. Um, thank you, Worship. Yes, it does refer to the, the pioneer communities in the former township of Euphrasia. Okay, Councillor uh, Nielsen, do you have a follow-up to that question? <clears throat> Sorry, yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, I was just more asking for clarity on the type of signage they're requesting. Councilor Little. I believe it's just like location that there was, you know, a settlement here, maybe no longer, but just some indication that the actual type of sign um, that would be determined, you know, as part of the municipal signage report. Okay, um, follow up, for, it's okay, Councilor Nielsen's okay for that. Uh, Councilor Little, just before I go to other questions, at one time there was a reserve to do signage that was put, that came from the original municipality of Artemisia. I don't uh, know if, that, if there's still funds, you're referring this back to uh, next year's budget. Uh, I guess that's something that would be teased out if there is any reserve funds that were left, because I know that, that they had left money in a reserve for signage and on that type of thing, right? And maybe you're familiar with that. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Other other questions? The motion was posted on the screen. It was verbally read by Councillor Little, second by Councillor Allwood. Any further discussions? All right, seeing none, all in favor of the motion? 
That is carried. Okay. All right. We're going on to the consent agenda. Are there any? There, Mr. Mayor, there's multiple items added to the agenda. Oh, yes. I always miss that part because I don't. I was really trying know. to hop in there quick before you could get going. I know. See, I just tried to zoom right on by. Don't I? I know. You think I get used to that? Uh, I got to go back to my original. Okay. Yes. We have three items. Two items from yourself and also uh, a possible notice of motion later on. So, Councilor Nelson, uh, your two items. Thank you, Bishop Mayor. Uh, the first item on uh, discussion will be the Police Services Board recommendation. Um, Madam Clerk did email out uh, um, uh, two different um, motions that were made at the different committee levels. So for the Police Services Board attachment report, uh, this council did already send in our recommendation, which was just to uh, send the one municipal um, member as well as an additional um, member uh, as a backup. And then um, to other than that, follow through with the report that the clerks gave us. At the Police Services Board level, there was discussion because uh, during this year's um, OAPSB, so the Ontario Association of Police Services Board's annual uh, conference, there was discussion about how the Solicitor General's recommendations have no maximum limit to the number of members that can be on the detachment board. Um, and then it was further kind of discussed at the zone five uh, level for the police services boards that exist that again, reiterated there's no limit. So uh, member Minifee and uh, member Halliday both moved and seconded a motion that um, recommends we uh, suggest to the Solicitor General that there is a community member from every min member municipality and First Nations on the detachment board, not just the um, report that was given to us that suggested that there'd be four community members on top of uh, three um, provincial appointees. Um, the reasoning behind this would be to have that community engagement, which exists currently on our police services boards. Uh, and so then uh, another thought was that maybe if this was the case, then we might not need the community uh, safety group or uh, yeah, okay. get the wording of that. Safety committee. Safety committee. Um, so this is uh, because of the uh, fact that technically the deadline has passed to send in our uh, suggestions. Uh, however, we have heard word from ministry reps that the uh, they're still accepting because some groups still haven't had a chance to send in their their um, uh, report uh, regarding the detachment police services boards that there's still time to receive additional information. This is hence the uh, time sensitive nature of this to try to get this in uh, as fast as we can. So I hope that's clear to everybody. Anybody has a question, I'm free to kind of answer. Well, just for clarity, before I go to questions, uh, Councilor Nielsen, I hope everybody has had a chance to look at the email or is looking at the email right now. Uh, you have the motion that was moved by Daryl Minifee, second by Stuart, or Stuart Halliday. Is that the motion that you are proposing to put forward? Yes, that's what I'm putting forward here at the councillor level. Although okay. Madam Clerk has popped up. She might have a question for me. Okay, Madam Clerk, for clarity. And then I got Councillor Little. Um, and just that the wording has to be a little bit different is because this one says, recommend that council direct staff. So yep. it would be just starting from that council direct staff to submit additional comments to the original um, Joint Police Service Board proposal. Um, and if anybody has any questions on how that will be submitted, I'd be happy to answer them because I've done a little bit of research because it's not as easy as you think. <laughs> okay, Councillor Little, are you seconding that? Or are you just no, asking? Sorry, I, just... If I, I don't remember seeing that and I can't find it. Who oh. sent it out and what time was it sent out? Madam Clerk. Um, I sent it out at the beginning of the meeting, right when Councillor Nielsen added it to the agenda. I sent it to all of council. I've got 102, is that correct? Yep, it was right after the beginning of the meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, take a second, take a look at it. Um, is there, if I have a mover, I just wanna wait to everybody has a chance to look at it if there's uh, a seconder that would consider seconding it. Yeah, Madam Clerk? Um, I guess I'll wait for a seconder. I just wanted to provide some information on the submission. Yeah. If I do get a seconder. Okay. Councillor Allwood, are you considering seconding it? Okay, it's on the floor, I'll Madam Clerk. For discussion purposes, thank you. Okay, Madam Clerk. 
Um, thanks. So although the ministry is still accepting um, comments coming in, they aren't submitted via an email. They're not submitted via um, a letter being proposed. There is a form, an online form that we were required to fill out. When the original form was filled out, um, in it, it asks if you are doing a joint proposal. If so, you had to check off the different municipalities that was included in your joint proposal. As you are aware from the previous report, uh, George and Bluff submitted the proposal on our behalf. So we have already submitted our comments. So I am in, now in the process of locating a contact that I can email because I cannot submit a singular one because we're already included in the joint one. Um, so um, I just wanted council to be aware of that. I am looking for the contact of who I can submit these comments to should this resolution pass um, to, so that they're aware of it, that it will be appended. Well, it can't be appended to our joint, but it could be taken into consideration because this is not something that came from the joint um, thing. Um, just like our alternate member was noted as a note that Gray Highlands Council has recommended an alternate member, um, this would be like asking to add another note to that joint submission that was already submit, submitted. So would Dwayne Sprague be a good contact? Um, he's, he's been- I have an email and I'm just waiting for a reply. Okay, okay. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's after the fact and okay. So the motion's on the floor. Uh, Council Lillard, did you get a chance to look at it? Thank you, Worship. I'm just wondering if it's still necessary if we're asking for an, um, one community representative in addition to the one council member, do we still need an alternate? I, I can speak to that, but I'll let Council Nielsen speak to that. <laughs> so I would just um, say that having an alternate in place um, this group, this attachment board, will be meeting um, most likely bi-monthly or possibly even quarterly. So, you know, if we have a municipal rep who, who misses and who's unfortunately able, not able to make it, I would want to see an alternate being there just so we have that uh, connection. We could have the community rep come and speak to council, uh, you know, bringing forward the uh, recommendations or just for clarity or information, the minutes of kind of thing, but having a council rep be there, I think is rather important because it's not a consistent meeting schedule. Well, sorry, it is a consistent meeting schedule, just not a frequent meeting schedule. And I, and I would add that I think moving forward, there may be at, on occasion motions coming from the individual municipality being forwarded to that police services board. You may want that municipal person to speak to it if, if there wish to be clarity or whatever okay uh any other any other comments does everybody understand the motion is everybody able has everybody been able to see the the email that's been sent out to understand the uh the uh, points and, and thanks uh madam clerk for doing that when you put something on the agenda it's always good to get as much information as you can um and it is a timing because this there was a special meeting was it last Thursday or was it last Friday, Councillor Nielsen? I can't remember. Want to say last Thursday we had the quick okay. special yeah. meeting with Council? Just after lunch, yeah. It was called by the chair. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, seeing there's no other discussion, the motion has uh, has been has been displayed on the screen. So no, maybe it hasn't been read out. Uh, Madam Clerk, are you able to read it out because you've changed it a little bit with regards to the wording and just to, to iterate, it was moved by Councilor Nielsen, second by Councilor Allred and Madam Clerk. That council directs staff to submit additional comments to the original Joint Police Service Board proposal, recommending that each municipality appoint one community representative in addition to the one council member and one alternate member as previously submitted. Thank you for that. Any further discussions? All right, seeing none, seeing none all in favor? Uh, I don't know Deputy Mayor, is it Deputy Mayor? Sorry, just, yep, okay. Uh, that's carried unanimously, thank you. Okay, and uh, Councilor Nielsen, your second uh, addition to the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, yesterday we had our Internet Infrastructure Task Force meeting. Um, at that meeting, there was discussion about the, so, uh, the responses so far to the survey we're, do, we're conducting. Um, unfortunately, we are having a low uptake in it. Um, 
Councilor Allwood has uh, discussed at previous council meetings that there's been success at the town of Blue Mountains um, getting responses to their surveys because they've used uh, supporting mailers to help uh, let uh, the residents know what's going on. Um, this council did approve uh, the double ITF to have some funds um, uh, given to it. So the request is uh, from the double ITF that we have staff put together a mailer. Um, I'm being a task force, we can't request staff's time and that will use some of the funds from the double ITF to cover the costs. Um, I don't know if uh, the, pardon me, sorry, I'm just looking at this. Yeah, there is a uh, total cost, I believe for this one was um, $941 to cover the cost of mailing the four by six cards out. And then I think it was a cost of $678 and changed for the creation of the four by six cards uh, for printing costs. So moved by Councillor, uh, sorry, moved by Councillor Nielsen, second by Deputy Mayor. And I will ask the clerk, or is it exactly how it's written in the email? Madam Clerk? Uh, no, the council directs staff to prepare and mail out a single-sided four by six postcard for the internet survey from the $5,000 already dedicated to the IITF survey. Okay, thank you for that. Motion is on the floor, moved by Councilor Nielsen, second by Deputy Mayor, any discussion? Councilor Allwood? Mm -hmm. There was some uh, talk of the uh, double ITF approving the, uh, the layout of the, the, the postcard. I'm not sure if it needs to be in the motion. Madam Clerk, clarity? Um, council doesn't need to approve what goes on the agendas for the IITF. So if council requested that from staff, if this gets approved here, staff will automatically do that as a request from IITF. Thank you for that clarity. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. Okay. Thank you. And the other item, I think, if desirable, will come up in the notice of motion. I think, Councillor Little, if you're going to do something here. All right, so consent agenda. There are a number of items uh, listed in that consent agenda. Are there any items that need to be pulled? I mean, there's general, sorry, Deputy Mayor, you're way down at the bottom of the screen. I can't see you there, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I'd like to pull uh, 21 or, sorry, no, not 21, 9.8, thank you. That's the reorganization department. Okay, Deputy Mayor. All right. Um, any other items wish to be pulled? I mean, we can still have general discussion on it. It just means that if you're thinking of changing the motion, you should you should pull it. Okay. Um, there may be some discussions there, but we are looking for a mover and a seconder for the consent agenda. Got Councilor Allwood, Councilor Nielsen. All right. Discussion on the consent. I come through all way. Thank you, Worship. Just a couple of comments on uh, 9.7, the uh, family physician survey results for Gray Highlands. Yes. So we only had uh, 95 responses, but 90% uh, of those responses were from people 35 years or older. Uh, the majority of that 90% were 55 to 64 years old, um, or the largest component of that was. 25% of those responders do not have a primary health care provider. And of the 75 that do, 60% of those uh, have their primary health care provider outside of the municipality. And 75% of those would prefer to have their primary health care provider in our, in our community. Um, I, I suggest that we do have a doctor shortage or a primary health care um, provider shortage in the municipality of Gray Highlands. And I believe uh, I, I'd like to see us uh, support that joint municipal uh, physicians retention and recruitment uh, committee, and perhaps even get uh, somebody from the uh, Southeast Gray Community Health Care Center to uh, perhaps present to uh, this council on uh, on their recruitment um, and physician and primary care healthcare providers uh, status. Thank you. 
just uh, if there's questions there, I don't know if there's questions, but I see that the, the survey came to Gray Highlands. Are we able to access the survey from the other municipalities just to see on a, on a snapshot from those other areas? Go ahead. Sorry, just muted. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Worship. There was a, a um, the minutes of the uh, committees did have a summary of the survey from uh, all of the participating municipalities and the results were pretty consistent, but okay. it was included in our last, uh, in our last minutes, I believe. It, it's very, uh, so that the survey, the staff report from Blue Mountains that uh, summarizes all of the surveys response, but this was specifically the Great Highlands response. And I, I just wanted to present it for clarity here today uh, to draw attention to the fact that there is a primary health care um, provider shortage in our municipality and that, um, thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, is there questions from council? I have a couple more, but is there questions from council on this? Okay, uh, just uh, the other question I did have is I had a call from Barb Pumpus, the mayor of uh, Meaford yesterday about doctor recruitment and uh, certainly their council did not support Monday night to continue so, or, or to supporting a recruiter, but she did allude to me that she certainly would like to have, and she probably will, I, I gave her her, I gave her your number. I don't know if she reached out to you or not, but she did want to work with the neighboring municipalities to sort of think outside the box on how to um, bring in doctors in our, our area the, the concern was on the doctor recruitment part of hiring a consultant was it's the old way of doing it and there's maybe other ways of doing it or, new, or newer ways of doing it so um i think she'll be reaching out further and uh, has she reached out to you Councillor elwood um thank you worship i have not specifically heard from uh mayor compass but um i do uh, i do know that the uh the motion to uh, hire a part-time recruiter has been put on hold pending a uh, report at tomorrow's meeting from Dr. Lisi. And uh, mm -hmm. there's also some issues uh, regarding uh, ROMP and Great Highlands not being promoted in that, uh, in that program, which I think you're aware of, Your Worship. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, just, I just got the emails and uh, quite frankly, I haven't had a chance to absorb it all, but I'll be reporting back to council at a future date. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, we just had, she had, she raised a lot of good points and about bringing doctors. And I know Paul Allen, uh, a number of years back was involved with the doctor recruitment committee. And, and I know we brought um, some funding that we had here from other organizations to, to bring doctors. I think we did bring a doctor in once and, and for a period of time and stuff like that. But anyway, she just felt that there may be other ways of, of allocating money that would maybe have a better traction versus just, just giving it to a recruiter. And, and so obviously they didn't support a recruiter at the Meaford Council, I think Monday night. So, uh, but she wanted to, she reached out to me to, to have further dialogue of how else we can look forward to uh, looking for uh, other doctors. And I think conversations with, the Grey Bruce Health Services and also working maybe with CHC. I, I did suggest to Deputy Mayor that maybe she reach out to you or John, Wood, John Woodbury because you guys are also part of the CHC as well. And collectively, maybe there's a lot of synergy that we could gather on other ways of looking at doctor recruitment. So I just wanted to share that from her conversation yesterday. And she may be reaching out to you, Councilor Owen. I gave, I gave her your number. Hope that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I welcome that. Thank you. Thank you, Worship. All right, you're quite welcome. Um, okay, is there anything on that else to do with like uh, it's an interesting survey? It's got some interesting stuff in there for sure, uh, for the detail. Um, I think it was only, was it 95? Is it 95 people responded? Is that right? I read it this morning. Um, right. Yeah, 95. Sorry? Yeah, 95. Okay, are there any other items on discussion with regards to the, uh, the consent agenda? Uh, I saw on our tax thing that we have over a, a billion dollars worth of assessment. Go ahead, Councillor Little. 
Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I'm just, it's just a question and I'm wondering if it would be possible to get the, um, the library board minutes sooner, um, like the January minutes are six months after the fact. It would be nice to have a, a more uh, up-to-date report coming back to council, thanks. So I have, I have the clerk ready at hand and then I have Deputy Mayor. Go ahead, Madam Clerk and Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. The plan is to get them more regularly. This is the first time that the library board has been submitted submitting uh, minutes. So from here on out, um, our CEO of the libraries has told me that as soon as the minutes are approved at the board, they will be forwarded to the clerk's department for adding to the next council agenda. Just you ask, the, it, it, it happens. There you go. Yeah, Deputy Mayor. No, no. Okay. Okay, good. No, that's super. Thanks for asking that question, Council Little. Um, I see the NBCA highlights. There, are, I did have a question there, but uh, is there any other comments with regards to the consent agenda? I see in our tax uh, 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 ratios, uh, one point five two percent. I think was the overall increase, and I saw a billion dollars over a billion dollars assessment. I think that was and uh, new money. I think was over three hundred thousand that we're raising and and new taxation. So it's just going by memory. Um, there was something that uh, Councillor Nielsen I saw on your in, on your NEC NBC highlights. I'm just going to pull it up here now. Um, is, there, is there anything else while I'm looking up that? <clears throat> Oh, the pre-consult, uh, if, if you're able to go to the, and they talk about the pre-consult and I, I have, I did reach out to them just last fall on a piece of property and I, I did get back, especially COVID, it's, it's a little slower, but uh, it does say that um, step one, pre-consult, pre-consultation with the NBCA's regulation staff is highly recommended prior to applying for a permit. NBCA's regulation staff will review your proposal with our technical staff before you apply. Pre-consultations can save time money by clearly giving direction on the policies and technical guidelines before plans are completed as it goes on. So I certainly encourage those out there that are going through the process. Uh, I'm, I, I know the, the Grace Robble does offer comments before, I think, as well, Councilor Little, and, and Soggy maybe as well. I don't know. I just saw it on the NBCA. I don't know if they have any comments there or not. But um, it's good that they, they provide that service. Okay. If there's nothing else uh, with regards to, oh, town of, uh, the South, Township of Southgate zoning bylaw amendment. Alan, did you, did, were you wanting to speak to that? Uh, I just saw that there. Um, not necessarily. I just put it on there to to um, make people aware of it's right on our the border of Grey Highlands and Southgate. And um, I guess now that you've given the the mic to me, um, I did wonder if um, if staff you know looks at them and if they've ever made comments or do they just allow Southgate to do their thing as Southgate allows us to do ours? I, I, I only invite comments from staff if they wish to comment. I would presume that if they felt that was prudent, they, they would comment. Um, Michael? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, to Council Allen. We do review these when, uh, when they do come in and uh, mostly for any impacts that would be on, the, on our side of the municipal border. Um, Usually when we have uh, something like this, where it's a, what we call a C4 shop and they, they call it something, something different, um, we just normally get directly in touch with, uh, with the planner if there's any questions or anything like that. Otherwise, it's uh, simply a no objection. Okay, Councillor Allen, do you have any follow up to that? Okay, so good. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Director Bennett. Okay, so other than uh, 9.8, um, uh, so it's moved by Councillor Elwood, second by Councillor Nielsen, that the items on the consent agenda be approved with the exception of item 9.8 that was pulled by the Deputy Mayor. Uh, any other discussion on those? Seeing none, all in favor? Uh, 
opposed? Carried. <laughs> that, I, 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 was, I was pretty much about to favor my hand was just outside of Yes. I, I'm okay. on a I'm on a laptop today and it's, it's I, very different. Uh, okay, I'll mark it down that it was unanimous period. Okay. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor, you have the floor. You pulled nine point eight. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I will put the um, the pre presented motion on the floor uh, just so we have something on the floor before I start. Yep. Okay. Moved by Deputy Mayor. Do I have a seconder for the, for the organizational chart? Councilor Little. Okay, Deputy Mayor, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Worship. Two questions uh, through you to the CAO. Um, the first one is that I don't see the um, uh, the library in in these organizational charts. Um, and the second question is, I, I seem to remember one iteration of the org chart where um, the museum was under the library and now it's it's under ECDEV. And I, was ju I just had questions on that, on, on whether the museum belonged under the library or whether, or, on, or why it's under ec ECDEV and not the library. Thank you. Okay. Madam CEO, good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you uh, to Deputy Mayor Desai. Um, so the report in front of you today uh, largely affects only two departments at this point in time. As you know, I've been overseeing the uh, landfills and the waste diversion, and um, the, we were transitioning slowly into forming the newly developed environmental services department. So this report is actually addressing um, those two dis uh, uh, sorry, departments specifically. And um, as I don't oversee the library, that we have a CEO of our library system, uh, our overall municipal org chart would obviously include the library as well. Uh, but this was just for informational purposes. Uh, on your question regarding the museum, the museum has always reported to our economic development uh, department. Um, there was a suggestion made after a meeting with a uh, senior management team, which included the CEO of the library, uh, that we look at an option to move the museum under the library. Those discussions haven't taken place yet. Uh, so this was just specifically to get the first part of uh, the reorganization under the new environment service department. Okay, thank you, Madam CEO. Follow up, Deputy Mayor. Uh, no, thank you very much, Madam CEO, for the uh, for the detailed answers. Um, I, I have nothing further to ask your worship. Okay. Any other questions to the organizer? Okay, Councillor Allen. Um, yeah, just um, I hate to say it or bring it up, but just a slight correction to the CAOs comments on the library it's actually the library board that um, oversees the library not the CEO okay all right other comments okay so I guess madam CEO does this mean that our one hour meeting a week can go to one hour and ten minutes now <laughs> tongue in cheek <laughs> You have more time, right? <laughs> yes, that's what I mean. You have a little bit more free time or different time. I will still be assisting the directors until things are running 100%. Right. I had sort out there. I thought maybe there'd be an extra 10 minutes. <laughs> All righty. Yeah, that's some fun. All right. So that's moved by Deputy Mayor Desai, second by Councillor Little. The council receives report CIO 2110 reorganizational departments for information. Thanks for the update. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? That is carried. Okay. So we have uh, three bylaws. Um, I know there was some information that was sent out uh, through an email that I think uh, was forwarded to everybody about some, some concerns or some issues that were being raised. Um, are any of those bylaws wish to be separated to vote on separately? Councillor Allen? Um, I'd like to pull 10.3 because I will be, I declared a pecuniary interest okay. on that. Right. Okay. So that will be separate. And uh, so um, 
um, are we, would somebody like to move 10.1 and 10.2? That's, that's the two bylaws, Deputy Mayor. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Allwood. Any discussion on those two, on those two uh, uh, bylaws? Councillor Little. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I just wanted to speak to uh, 2021-038 and thank planning staff for following up on um, areas of concern so thoroughly. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Are there any other comments with regards to Bylaw 202138 and 202159, which were moved by Deputy Mayor Desai and seconded by Councillor Allward. Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. Okay, and so the next one is Bylaw 202160, and the Councillor Allen has declared a pecuniary interest with that and has stepped out. Is there any discussion on that particular bylaw? Deputy Mayor, did you indicate no? I was going to move your worship. Okay, moved by Deputy Mayor. Do I have a second by Councilor Nielsen? The bylaw 2021-060, a bylaw to opt out of the vacant unit rebate program under section 361 of the Municipal Act 2001. Any comments? Councilor Little. Um, there were some comments made in open forum, and I'm wondering if uh, those comments can be taken under advisement for discussion during um, our next budget process. Would that be the appropriate time? Um, that was looking at tax, tax ratios for uh, commercial costs. So tax ratios were set at the county, but Madam CEO. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's exactly what I was going to say. That okay. the, the tax ratios are set by the upper tier. So they uh, tell the lower tiers what those ratios are going to be. Uh, the tax ratio for 2021 did go down ever so slightly for commercial and um, industrial. Not quite clear on the reasoning behind that. Uh, we did try and get a hold of the county uh, this afternoon, but haven't got a response. Not sure if the mayor or deputy mayor have anything to add to that, uh, but we, the lower tier has no control over ratios. Thank you, Madam CEO. And that's why uh, in that delegate or in the open forum that I wanted to iterate that question, but certainly I don't know, um, we can, myself or the deputy mayor can, can try to find that out a little bit more why that went down, but certainly the ratios are at the county level and um, I don't know, Deputy Mayor, do you have anything to add to that? I I don't. Uh, I know um, we have a new finance director, Mary Lou. I don't I don't have anything to add right now. Um, I, I can definitely go back and uh, and look at the report that had come uh, before County Council. Okay, Councillor Little, do you have any follow up to that? Then? Um, sorry, Your Worship. I'm just trying to remember. Was this um, this draft bylaw? Um, kind of the recommendation coming out of County Council. Just trying to read to the, the previous meeting. Deputy Mayor, you sort of, the Deputy Mayor, you sort of followed through on this because you brought this to our council, but then you also brought it to the County Council as well. I don't know if you're able to speak to that. Sorry, could, uh, could Councillor Little repeat her question? It's the audio is cutting in and out. Sure. Uh, thank you. I apologize, uh, Deputy Mayor. I don't remember the exact way that this came to council, and um, I was wondering the the origin of it. Did it start with council and then come through that council had done this, and that um, the lower tiers would consider and follow suit? Was that was that the process? Um, so th this had started at um, at county council, and I I brought it up at County Council and I was advised that staff were already uh, looking into it. Um, 
I brought it up sort of at the start of COVID, at, at which point it was somewhat deemed uh, not a good time to make that change. Uh, so it, it came back earlier this year, uh, at which point I brought it back to uh, municipal council and, and um, um, asked that we, we uh, make that change locally as well uh, on the rebate. And uh, th that's sort of the origins uh, of that. Um, if I may, Your Worship, right. I, I do support, and I've always wondered why we why we offer a vacancy rebate. So I, I do support the idea, but even when considering it, when we first considered it, you know, I wondered about the impact of, that COVID would have, and maybe sweep up some people that um, maybe shouldn't be part of this. Um, you know, reducing this rebate. Um, so I'm wondering if there might be any consideration for putting some time limits on um, that the rebate would be for properties that had been vacant for a certain period of time. Um, or maybe we need to um, you know, think about this a little bit more and um, before we, I don't wanna make a rash decision here, but just based on the comments um, from Open Forum, wondering if, if there's a way of addressing um, the risk that we may sweep, you know, sweeping everybody up under this one bylaw may not be the fairest way to do it. Just my, uh, my comment. And so you're referring to is specifically or example of like with COVID and there could be businesses that could get caught up that are having us are struggling is what you're saying, right? And I think that, yeah. Sorry, because, because of COVID, they're struggling. You know, they were viable. They weren't vacant. They were operating before COVID. But then we know there are examples of properties that have been vacant for a long time. And COVID really was not a factor in that. So maybe we could have a little more discretion. Okay. So just uh, I'll go, maybe go back to the number, But just, Madam CEO, if you're able to, if you run into a situation where you were vacant of a, your business and you weren't able to operate say for a quarter are you allowed to go back and make application are you able to go back or it's only going for it i don't know are you able to answer that madam ceo as a, as a deputy treasurer hmm. i'm sorry mr Mayor. i'm not sure what the question was go back yeah so so basically so say you've been vacant so say your business has been closed for 14 months because of COVID. Um, are you only able to, like, under the current, like the way the vacancy uh, out of the vacancy rate program worked is you'd have to make application because you weren't running a, biz a business, right? But are you able to go retro, are you able to go back because if you could prove that your, your business wasn't running for say 16 months, are you able to go back and apply for a credit on your taxation if you weren't able to run as, as being vacant because you've been shut down because of COVID, are you able to go back and make so that I, I, or is it only going forward? Th thank you, Mr. Mayor. I believe it is going forward. I don't think it is retroactive. I don't have the um, uh, criteria here with me at this okay. point in time. Okay, so so I got a couple of people's hands. Thank you for that. There may be other comments, but I appreciate your comment there. So I got Deputy Mayor and then Councilor Allwood. Thank you, Worship. I think it's um, it's important to recognize that COVID has affected all all commercial properties, uh, regardless of whether they were vacant or or otherwise. Um, so there there's properties that weren't vacant, had a business in them, but they weren't operating. But they wouldn't have. I don't think they would have qualified for a vacant rebate. Um, there's commercial properties that 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 are owned by someone and they run a business out of there, which they would have paid the full commercial rate, uh, even though they were not necessarily able to run their operation out of it. So I, I think it's, um, we perhaps need to be careful when we're considering the effect of COVID on, on, uh, on businesses because there's there's businesses that have had to pay their full commercial uh, tax um, even though they've they've done no business at all because they were shut down due to the restrictions. So I, I don't know that I would be able to support a vacant rebate because 
there was a uh, a shutdown during COVID. Okay, thanks for that, Councilor Alwood. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, my understanding from the open forum presentation was, you know, it applied to the landlords paying those property taxes when their businesses, small businesses that were renting their properties, uh, who, who would have been eligible for uh, some sort of rent relief under COVID programs. But the the uh, vacant property tax rebate was uh, basically building owners and uh, commercial building owners or industrial property class owners that uh, kept their um, buildings open for tax relief and were not really interested in putting clients into that or, you know, the, the, the program was perceived to be uh, working against getting those storefronts filled. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that the uh, um, open forum comments today were really made, I, I'm, I took it that they were made from a landlord's perspective. Right. Thank well, you. and that's and that's the case if, if you can't find tenants, you know, you, you could have a real issue or like you said, the other side is you, you're just not looking for tenants, right? There's also that side is of, of the equation, right? Councilor Little, does that help or do you, are you looking at deferring it to get more information? What's your thoughts here? Um, honestly, Your Worship, I'm a little bit confused. I just thought that uh, since those um, concerns had been raised that it was an appropriate time to have this conversation. Um, I, do, I do agree with uh, Councillor Allwood and Yeah, <laughs> I don't know that I have, sorry, sorry, everybody. I just don't know that I have the clarity. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with the way things stand. Okay, I'm just gonna say if you, were, if you wanted to move a motion to defer it to a period of time, that could be done as well, if you're not comfortable with that. So I'll read it out here. Uh, again, Deputy Mayor, a second by Councillor Nielsen. The bylaw 2021 60, a bylaw to opt out of the vacant unit rebate program under section 364 of the municipal act 2001. Any last conversations, discussions? It's seeing none. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Okay. All righty. So. We move on to then uh, notice a motion. Take a break, madam, or madam, sorry, Mr. Mayor. I know my hair is getting long. I know I need to get a haircut. But <laughs> I was going to say madam clerk, but you're the one chairing the meeting, so I shouldn't be asking her to take a break. Hey, no problem. You're right. Okay, so, okay, what do we got for time here? We got uh, 4.38, so 40, uh, 12 minutes, or you want more? 12 minutes would be fine. Okay, so we'll come back at 10 to 5. Okay, see you then.
Madam Clerk, can you hear me? It says you, my uh, video is disabled. You should be okay now. You had left it on when we went into recess, so I turned it off. And whenever oh. host turns it off, you need permission to turn it back on. Thank you. We don't want anybody jogging. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, are we everybody back? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Okay. We'll call this uh, meeting back to order at 451. All right. So moving on to our agenda, item 11.1. Councilor Allred, you are bringing forward a notice of motion. I am your worship. Would you like me to read that or? Yep, go ahead. And then I go ahead. Move it as written. Uh, sure. Well, uh, you read it out because you'll need to read it out to make sure you get a seconder for yourself, right? Thank you. Whereas the Grey Highlands Chamber of Commerce is an integral partner between local businesses and the municipality, and whereas the relationship between the two needs to be fostered in a way that promotes growth and prosperity for the community in which it serves. And whereas the Chamber is a not-for-profit association and provides services and resources to visitors, residents, and businesses, now therefore be it resolved that the Council of the Municipality of Grey Highlands discuss the relationship between the Grey Highlands Chamber of Commerce and the municipality, as well as the annual funding options as well as the options for annual funding and that these discussions take place at a committee of the whole meeting. Okay, thank you for that. Do I have a, a seconder for that uh, notice a motion? Councilor Nielsen? Okay, so do you, okay, so it's on the floor, Councilor Allwood. It's been seconded by Councilor Nielsen. Do you have uh, anything to add to your motion before I go to other questions? No, I, I, I don't have anything to add at this time, Your Worship. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Nielsen, as a seconder, do you have anything to add to the notice of motion? Just would add that we had a fairly lengthy conversation at the last council meeting and that <clears throat> this notice of motion kind of supports the discussion that was had then. Okay, very good. Other, other discussions or conversations uh, on the notice of motion that's on the floor? Okay. Seeing none, all in favor of the notice of motion. All right, that is carried. Just a point of clarity, your worship. Yeah. Is there, is there usually a time frame associated with the? Uh, I just wanted to point out that it should happen before the uh, budget deliberation starts. But I'm going to assume, I'll, I can ask the clerk, I would assume it would get added to the list of items that does come forward on our committee the whole process, but um, I will not put words in my clerk's mouth, so Madam Clerk. <laughs> uh, you are correct, Mayor McQueen. So we will add it to the list. Um, as you're aware, certain ones, like there is one that doesn't have to be completed until February of next year. So that one kind of just gets bumped down if there's ones that need to happen a little bit sooner. Um, but uh yeah, so uh, we're dwindling down on the items on the community of the whole list, so it, it shouldn't be too much longer. It should be done before uh, budget in my, as it stands right now. I'll just put it that way. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, thank you for that, Madam Clerk. Um, okay, so that's, is there anything else from that, Councilor Owen, in the sense of process? Uh, no, thank you, Worship. Thank you for that clarity. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the second uh, notice motion, and then I'll come to you next after that, Councillor a little if you wish to, if you're considering something. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, 11.2, uh, you have a, re a motion to reconsider. Thank you, Mayor McQueen. Um, <clears throat> I'll move it uh, to bring it on the floor. Uh, thank you. Okay, and do I, so, uh, um, okay, so, well, um, do you mind reading it, and then, as, as Councilor sure. Alwood did, and then, then I'll... Uh, Your Worship, I would move that in accordance with procedural bylaw section 19 reconsideration, that the decided matter regarding resolution 2021-425, Backyard Chickens Day, be reconsidered, and if decided in the affirmative by two-third vote of the whole of Council, the original matter shall become the next order of business. 
Okay. Do I have a seconder for that notice of motion? Councillor Little. Okay. Mayor, Councillor Little. And the floor is yours. If you wish to add anything to that uh, notice of motion, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, there's been a number of um, uh, points that have been brought up. Uh, point, in an point, email. Of order, point of order, Your Worship. Your point? Do we not have to vote on whether to reconsider oh. before we have discussion? Uh, Your Your Worship, according to Section nineteen point five, I am allowed to uh, to give a bit of a background as to why I am bringing this forward. But there is no debate. No. Okay. Thank you. Right. You're, you're allowed to, and is the seconder allowed to add anything to that, just to, or just yourself? Um. Uh, the bylaw only says the mover. Okay, just the mover. Okay, I have a I have a question for clarity, but I'll ask that later. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, one of the one of the items that was brought up was with regards to the um, contamination of uh, water. Uh, to which, in an email, um, the question was raised that there is a higher chance of contamination because the septic tank is closer than the chicken coop. Um, I, I would argue that the septic tank is designed to keep contaminants within an enclosed space and not allow that uh, contamination to leak out of that. Um, so I would argue that the chickens in this case do cause, do pose more of a, of a danger to the, um, uh, to the water. Um, the other question or the other comment that was made was they're, they're pets and not livestock. Um, so, to answer the question of whether chickens are considered pets or livestock, I did go to um, uh, section three, which is definitions under uh, bylaw 2004-50. Uh, and the exact quote from that bylaw, your worship, is livestock shall mean chickens, turkeys, cattle, hogs, horses, mink, rabbits, sheep, goats, or any other domestic animal used for human consumption. At the last meeting, um, when we passed this day, I had asked what the recourse would be um, if someone was facing a grievance due to uh, uh, due to a neighbor's backyard chickens uh, since we were allowing this day. Um, at that time, we'd sort of mentioned, uh, not by name, but we'd mentioned the protections under the Pound Act where um, you can contact the, um, the authorized person to come and take the, um, uh, the chicken away. Um, Unfortunately, with chickens, they don't like staying in one spot too long. So I doubt uh, they'd be willing to wait for the uh, uh, for the person to come by. Uh, there is the option as well to uh, for the person, uh, the complainant themselves, to uh, distrain the chickens. Um, and if the owner of the chickens is unknown, they can bring them to the clerk. Um, I don't I don't know if uh, the clerk wants chickens in her office either. Uh, I would I would imagine not. <laughs> uh, colleagues, the question at the end of all of this is is not um, it, it, it remains whether a resident who followed all the regulations that are set out in our bylaws should be made unable to enjoy their own property uh, because someone else decided to uh, uh, to to engage in an activity that wasn't explicitly permitted. Um, so at, at the end of the day, we, we have to uphold the bylaws equally for everyone. Um, and it's, it's a tough uh, decision, um, but it, unfortunately, I do think that we should reconsider this day, especially because we're getting complaints. Thank you. Okay, so procedurally, uh, Madam Clerk, the person that's moving the notice of motion for reconsideration is the only person that speaks. Um, my question for clarity is, um, I know what two thirds are of a full council. Today we have six. What's two thirds of, is it, is it of elected body or is it of those present during the time that the question's being put forward? It's two thirds of those present. So we would require a vote of four. Okay. All right. So uh, seeing that the procedure is only allowing the, the person bring it forward, so then I will be calling the vote on the reconsideration of the decision that was made last council. Okay, so I guess the question will be those that are in favor of the reconsideration. 
Okay, those opposed? So, Madam Clerk, if it's 3 3, that I would say would be a loss, right? Okay. So, motion is lost. And I guess for the record, it was a 3 3 tie, and, and that's where it was left. Okay. Uh, you, sorry. You know, Rich, sorry, just a point of clarity then. If we are um, issuing this day, my question still remains on, on, a, on an appropriate uh, recourse for any complainant. They, right now, they don't have a bylaw that they can fall back on to sort of bring an issue to council. So what is their recourse? Where, that, I guess that's my question of clarity um, on, on what their recourse would be. What I can share as far as information is um, I did reach out to the uh, director of planning, um, Michael Benner, of the process of when the uh, bylaw will be coming forward. I think all of the council was copied in that, that it is coming back on July 7th. And maybe I should refer to Mr. Benner on that. I would prefer to refer to Mr. Benner on that email that he did send out. And I just want to confirm is that the time frame, uh, Planner Benner, that you you had mentioned last week? Uh, yes, uh, yes, sir. It is. Is we're bringing the a draft bylaw to council on uh, first meeting in July, which I believe is July seventh. Okay, because because there was there was comments made that it could be longer than that, and I think that's so. That's two meetings from now. Madam Clerk, you popped up. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I just wanted to provide a little bit of clarity. The Pounds Act does take precedence. Um, it, it is still in force and effect. So if there is um, livestock and poultry is included in that livestock definition in the Pounds Act running at large, so off of the property of where it belongs, they can call bylaw enforcement who can take that animal to the pound keeper um, and it's contrary to what deputy mayor Desai said they don't deliver them to me they do the, the pound keeper delivers notice to me that they had impounded the the animals um, so but that act is a provincial legislation and it is in force and effect for any livestock that is um, outside of its own property um, we did have a staff report that went to council in December of 2019 related to uh, our own bylaw. Um, we had started consultation on that and um, we'd started consultation on that and uh, it got stalled as COVID had started, um, but we actually didn't receive any comments back from that. We uh, looked at it again when this had started coming up. We hadn't received any comments. So since it's been so long, we're actually redistributing that request for comments on the proposed bylaw that I brought forward back in 2019. And just to follow up on that, Madam Clerk, I thought the Katie Livestock Market was the pound that we are, have agreement with. Are you, I just remember that back a few years back that that's, uh, there was some bylaw that that was the pound keeper for us. Are you? Yes, under the Pounds Act, we're required to uh, have a pound keeper and our pound keeper is um, Katie uh, Livestock. Yeah. And so our bylaw enforcement will generally attend to the location and deliver the animals to the uh, Katie. Does that uh, answer your questions, Deputy Mayor? Or do you have any further questions? I mean, I mean, the question still stands. Chickens don't usually tend to stay in graze. So, you know, what happens, what happens then? Um, in, in the event of, um, you know, can a complainant set up a trap where the chickens are, you know, if they venture onto their property, the chickens are now trapped and then, you know, fall, take them to the pound in that manner. Um, I just think we've, we've, um, created a space where there is no rules, there is no regulations, and that's a dangerous place as a municipality and as a society, I would argue. But that philosophical discussion is for another day. But for now, I think um, 
we we just don't have any rules. And you've mentioned the timeline for July 7th, but in the past when bylaws have come, we've usually taken our time and you know forward referred them to a committee of the whole so that we can have more fulsome discussion on them. Um, and you, you know, um, I just think um, rules are there for a reason. Rules have to be enforced, and uh, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm left a little disappointed by the fact that we're uh, choosing not to enforce the rules, and we've effectively left no recourse for for anyone who has uh, any complaints. Okay, there may be other information on on capturing ca uh, animals or livestock that are uh, at large. I know not just chickens, uh, horses, cattle, goats, pigs, as you mentioned in your description are also considered livestock. So, Councillor Nielsen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Question of clarity to Madam Clerk. Um, the pound bylaw that you were discussing and, and um, for reference um, for the property owner adjacent, it is, our, would it be our bylaw officer that they're contacting or would it be the OPP? So the animals would be trespassing and, and out on different properties. So um, just for reference and for clarity, um, this is the, the Pound Act is where I think this, is, this situation belongs. If the animals aren't being made contained on the property, then that is outside of what the stay order was about. Their animals are trespassing onto the land. So that's where I think the Pound bylaw made more sense so so um it's my understanding and i don't know a whole lot about this issue but it is my understanding that the original came in to our bylaw officer as a zoning violation um, right. because there was nothing in our zoning bylaw that permitted um uh the keeping of of, of livestock in that area or poultry in that area um However, a complaint under the Pounds Act, I think, would be something different. Um, Michael may be able to provide a little bit more information, but it's not something that we've dealt with on a regular day-to-day -day or course-to-course -course basis. So it is something that we'd have to look at further and probably discuss with our bylaw enforcement officer. So, but I do so believe that it is outside of this day, but I have to go back and look at the wording of this day <clears throat> that was passed. And, and so you're, you're saying that there'd be some conversation with the bylaw officer, because that's my question is for the, for the neighboring property, is it the bylaw officer they're going to contact in regards to the pound or is it the OPP that they contact in regards to the pound? That was kind of my question. I, and, I, and I don't even know. And I think you're saying you kind of need clarity on that one too. Yeah, the last issue that we had in relation to livestock at large, it was our bylaw officer that attended the site um, about Technically, our bylaw officer is under contract to enforce our bylaws. We don't have a livestock at large bylaw. So we had this kind of a weird gray zone, which is why we started with the livestock at large bylaw to begin with. Um, but in that, in that regard, it is provincial legislation. And I don't think council can provide a stay under a legislation of the province. Uh, we would be out of our out of our jurisdiction in that regard. Um, I'm not sure about the OPP's response to uh, the Pounds Act. Again, this, it's not something that I'm able to comment on at the present time. Fair enough, and thank you very much for your answers, even though I'm putting you on the spot. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other further questions on this uh, item? So I just said, in a sense, to uh, Planner Benner, who is also overseeing bylaw do you have any comments with regards to the pounds uh pounds keeper act or anything to do with enforcement as far as uh animals that i guess you'd call it at large maybe i don't know do you have any comments thank you mr mayor um i have had over my career a few instances where we've um worked through the pounds act to uh, secure livestock at large um in my instance they were cattle, so larger than chickens. Um, but the, the Pounds Act is separate from the zoning bylaw. Uh, so with the, the chickens, if, if there are chickens that are considered livestock or you know, agricultural animals, um, if they're not contained within their own home farm or property, whatever you, they're livestock at large. 
and uh, we just had a very recent episode where our enforcement officer had to go out and collect 50 chickens that were on a road allowance. Um, those animals were collected, brought to, uh, I believe, the to the, the Kiti um, livestock um, for yeah, the livestock area for for retention until we found the owner or or found other owners for the chickens. So I would tend to think that under the Pounds Act, a similar situation would would occur if it if there were chickens in in a another property that weren't owned by them. Okay. I don't know if there's any questions to our planner on that. Seeing no other questions, uh, moving on then. You know, uh, moving on then to Councillor Little. Uh, are you, oh, I can ask if you have a notice of motion or are there any notice of motions that wish to be brought forward? Councillor Little. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Your Worship. It would be a direct motion as it's time sensitive. Uh, I believe the sooner we get moving on this, the better. I forwarded a copy to the clerk, but I'm not sure the process would council have to vote on accepting a direct motion before the motion goes forward. What's, what's the process? So, Madam Clerk. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, we would require a resolution from council uh, that council uh, consider Councillor Little's notice of motion related to the Conservation Authority Act regulatory changes at the current meeting, and it would require two thirds to pass before you could put your motion on the floor. Okay, uh, so Councillor, are you considered? Do you have a, some some the reason why you want to bring that forward? Do you have some some points that you want to raise to to bringing it forward? I guess. <laughs> Go ahead. You have the floor. You're on mute. Move to bring forward a motion relating to the um, potential impacts to the municipality from the regulatory changes to the Conservation Authorities Act that was um, uh, summarized in our presentation earlier today, the delegation from the Gray Subble Conservation and Nottawasug Valley Conservation Authority CAOs. And um, there is, a, there is a, the clock is ticking. And so um, I think it's beneficial to provide direction um, as soon as possible. Just point of clarity then. So you're looking at getting something forward for the June 27th deadline? No, your worship. Um, just looking for, looking towards getting the ball moving on uh, potentially following through with, you know, direct correspondence to the minister and to the premier. Okay. All right. Okay, so does everybody understand the direct motion that's being brought forward? Would somebody like to second it? Or would you want to see it written out first to make sure you understand what it is in the clerk? And maybe the clerk needs clarity first. No, the clerk needs a motion to allow a direct motion first that requires oh, two third. Oh, okay, okay. Well, so, part of, so part of that process, so just hang on, Madam Clerk. Madam Clerk, Madam Clerk. So, so just I want to get. Oh. So, part of the process, we need a motion to allow a direct motion. But so, to allow a direct motion, do we have to add? Is that enough clarity that was presented from the person bringing it forward? Um. Yes. So she provided intent of her notice. She mentioned it was related to the Conservation Authority Act. She provided a brief and concise yep. statement as to why she needs it on here. So yes, it requires two thirds for council to uh, put that motion on the table to discuss it at this meeting. Thank you so, very much. For that. Yeah. Okay. So do I have a seconder then to bring that correct motion forward? Council Little is moving it. Councilor Nielsen. Okay. Discussion on the direct direct motion. That uh, it was explained by Council Lowe. Okay, seeing none, uh, all in favor? Okay, so that's come forward. So, Council Lowe, we have the floor with regards to bringing a motion forward. Yeah, pr approval, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. So, I did forward some wording to the clerk, um, but I'll read it out that Council directs staff to meet with Conservation Authority staff to determine 
effects of regulatory changes in the Conservation Authority Act and to identify specific items of municipal concern and report back to council. And so okay. um, maybe the clerk can share that, that wording. Yeah, and so the viewing public can see that as well. <clears throat> Is there a time frame on that, um, Councilor Little? Because you mentioned about a time frame to have something mm -hmm. come back. I think the um, staff uh, staff of conservation authorities and municipal staff will be meeting anyway, so it would be, um, I think, prudent to have um, municipal staff be considering, you know, the impacts that. The potential impacts on the municipality and uh, report back to council to see how we might go about if, if it was council's wish based on that report to to take it a step further and um, and write you know Minister Yurick and um, and the Premier. Okay. Do you want Amo in there as well or I guess that's something I'll come back and decide. It'll, it'll yeah. come back, but uh, it's just to get the ball rolling. Um, and I think the sooner the better. Okay. So uh, as that comes forward, do we have a, did I get a seconder for the verbal those, or the motion that was brought forward? Did I get a did I get a verbal seconder? Okay, Councillor Nielsen was right. Okay. So we're just waiting for the clerk to finish that and post it. I think she did post it, Your Worship, but. Um... Oh, sorry. Sorry, Your Worship. I had shared my screen the whole time that Council Little was speaking. Oh, okay. I didn't. Okay. Can you just do that again, just for a second? Okay. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Thank you. Any discussion on that motion? Other than Councillor, do you have anything to add? No. No. Any discussion on that motion? That direct motion, I guess you want to call it. Okay. Seeing none. All in favor? That's carried. I apologize, Madam Clerk. You probably did. I, it's been a long day. <laughs> Your Worship, right. was there was there a motion made to go past five? No. You moving it? Sure. Or 18 minutes past, but a second by Councillor Nielsen that uh, we go past five o'clock. Well, at least 18 minutes past five. Uh, any discussion on that? If not, all in favor? That's carried. Thank you for that. And that was passed at 518. Um, are there any other notice of motions wish to be brought forward to next council? Are there other notice of motions? Okay, seeing none. Uh, county county highlights. Uh, uh, we had a meeting last week. Um, my computer is frozen here for a second. So, Deputy Mayor, do you have anything to add while I re restart my computer here? <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> I'm trying to think back to the meeting. Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I'm completely blanking on it. I, yeah, the, the highlights are there. If there's any specific questions, I'm more than happy. Yeah, are there any questions from council to the highlights for uh, County Council? If not, can I have a motion to receive those highlights? Councilor Little, second by Councilor Nielsen. All in favor? That's scary. I don't know if it's my computer or it's getting, I always have internet issues around 5.30, so I don't know if it's everybody coming home. I don't know what it is, but I just noticed there's a bit of a delay there, so. All right, so moving on then. So uh, council privileges, is there any uh, uh, items that council wish to bring forward for information or other? 
You got to lose. You got to change your mute button, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, on June eighth, uh, I believe, uh, yep, last Tuesday, I attended the uh, Western Ontario Regional Session uh, input session for the entire Commissioner consultations, uh, as uh, as Council had uh, asked me to represent uh, or attend on Council's behalf. Um, the entire session was based around four questions. Uh, the first question was what changes need to be made to the existing code of conduct. Um, the second question was re with regards to the um, uh, the recommendations that AMO had put forward and, and what uh, position uh, people were taking on it. Uh, the third question was with regards to any additional changes, uh, if, there if there was any. Um, and um, the fourth question was with regards to stronger penalties and under what circumstances uh, stronger penalties should be considered. Um, on the first question, changes to the existing uh, code of conduct, uh, the, sort of the most common um, comment was um, having a, a standard um, code of conduct across the province so that municipality to municipality, there's not any, any differences. Um, the, the, the another uh, fairly common comment was also around education on the code of conduct, that we needed more of that. And it would be easier to do that if, it, if there was a uh, standard provincial, provincially standardized code of conduct. Uh, there was um, largely there was uh, uh, support, uh, generally speaking, for uh, recommendations from uh, AMO. Um, and uh, there was also, again, the education piece was brought up under this as well. Uh, under changes, any additional changes, um, there was a couple of interesting comments um, on this. Uh, the, one of them was with regards to uh, integrity commissioners itself. Um, instead mm -hmm. of municipalities going out and, and uh, picking an integrity commissioner, so to speak, uh, the, the recommendation or the, the suggestion was that there should be a central uh, pool of integrity commissioners. And that's where if municipalities needed um, services of an integrity commissioner, it would go through that pool. Um, it, would, it would help in decreasing wait times because there'd be more integrity commissioners um, in that pool who could take on cases that, you know, that fell outside of the municipalities they currently serve, for example. Um, the, the issue that was raised with that was that in certain cases, a, um, an integrity commissioner is more familiar with the history and the background of, of uh, certain complaints because they might closely relate to a different one. And so having a different one, different integrity commissioner come in, uh, you could lose that. So that there wasn't really a consensus on that. Uh, the second one was that the integrity commissioner should be the one that decides on the implementation of the recommendations that are being made. Uh, it should not be for council debate. It, it shouldn't be a case where the integrity commissioner presents recommendations and then leaves it up to council and, and steps away. Uh, the integrity commissioner should be um, recommending or deciding on how to implement those recommendations as well. Um, there's also the, um, they also raised the issue of um, increased anonymity uh, for members of staff to make um, complaints. And the other um, fairly interesting one, and I, and I refer to this one as interesting, Your Worship, because it's not something that uh, we've necessarily seen in, in our, or at least on the two councils that I've been on, I haven't really seen this to be an issue. Uh, but dealing with spouses of, uh, of members of council was one of the recommendations as well, or suggestions as well, uh, because in certain in enough cases, clearly, um, the spouse has sort of become the de facto spokesperson for the member of council, uh, and the spouse is exempt from the code of conduct. So um, there were suggestions on, on maybe there needs to be something in that regard as well. Um, and then on the fourth question, which was uh, stronger penalties, um, under what circumstances should they should they be considered? Um, there was two main circumstances. The first one was for ongoing infractions. Uh, if someone continues on with the same behavior over and over, 
uh, that should be considered. Um, the second one, and this is almost a direct quote, um, was in, in serious um, matters. And it basically said, um, if, if we look at it from, a, from an equity perspective, if staff could lose their job uh, for doing what they do, for doing what the um, council member did, the politician should also perhaps, perhaps lose their job. So indirect, or well, quite fairly, quite directly, um, they referenced that maybe the integrity commissioner should have the leeway to um, effectively terminate uh, the term of a member of council. Uh, those were the highlights. Um, there's still, we can send in additional comments to the minister by uh, July 15th. Uh, the website that had been provided was uh, ontario.ca slash consultation. Um, if there's any further questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Did you have anything to add to the conversation that you thought maybe should be added or maybe sent by our municipality or do you have any, you know, from, so, I know I, I dealt through it through AML and, and, and um, uh, Minister Clark spoke to us as a full AML board. So I've, I've gone through that process, but I don't know if you have anything you wish to add or, or, or maybe it was a good learning experience following through it as well. It, it definitely was a good learning experience. And, and in, in most cases, uh, by the time it got to me, uh, someone else had mentioned it already. So it, it turned out more of a, me supporting someone else's statement, effectively saying I support that person's statement rather than me being able to add anything new. Um, but it certainly it was it was a, a learning experience for 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 me, uh, and and quite grateful to have been a part of it. Okay, thank you. And um, so I think the uh, I think there when I listened to it just briefly there was some reference to an Ottawa case. Or I know that from the discussion, there was larger, but there were just, there was a couple of references, people that I was sitting in on made reference to, and I wasn't as familiar with the Ottawa case, but they made reference to the Ottawa case quite a bit. So I. <laughs> yeah. And, and that one was, um, if I remember correctly, it was under, it was regarding the implementation. Um, and um, it was that, that's, that was the context for why it should be the integrity commissioner that recommends the implementation and, and not left up to council debate um, because they, they mentioned in, in, in a lot of cases, these are your friends, these are your colleagues, you work with them a lot, so you don't really want to bring the hammer down. And uh, yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, glad you were able to attend. <clears throat> uh, any other council privileges or items to be raised uh, for an old, uh, Council Nielsen and I got some ice cream in our face last Saturday. Uh, we attended the Rockland uh, event and, and had a, a quite a long chat with uh, uh, Transit Street. What was the first name? Uh, Main Street? No. Bruce Street. Bruce Street. Street. And Blair yes. was his name. Yeah, that's right. Bruce Street Technology. So it's hard to believe that they got internet in downtown uh, Rockland. Fiber. 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 I was going to say they have three different providers in Rockland. Rockland is our little internet hub. That's right. So anyway, I'm, I'm, uh, it was, uh, and, and I will say that uh, uh, good for the Rockland um, uh, bed and breakfast with regards to, they have a great little ice cream shop there. So if you do have a chance to attend uh, and they serve Chapman's ice cream. So can't beat that. Okay, are there any, uh, we've got lots to do yet. So if there's nothing else, sorry, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Worship. Um, this one's a bit, uh, a bit of a heavy, heavy issue. Um, it's uh, something that I, um, I expressed at uh, County Council last week. Uh, and it's, it's with regards to the, the recent events that have happened, um, not, not locally in Great Highlands, but definitely in Ontario and across Canada. Um, the, there was 215 lives and, and since then that number has increased. Um, that, that were cut short and, you know, what can only be described as uh, attempted cultural genocide and four lives ended by uh, a person's blind hatred. Uh, and of course, there's, there's an orphan nine-year-old. Um, I've, I've found it, personally, I found it hard to say anything when these things happen. Um, because what, what can I say that could improve um, the situation? What can I say that could make tomorrow better. Um, these questions lead me to think twice um, before I say anything. 
And perhaps that's wrong in itself, because after all, it's been said that uh, silence in the face of injustice is, um, is complicity with the oppressor. Um, what I do want to say, uh, though, Your Worship, is that I, I, I remain proud to be a Canadian. Uh, I'm an immigrant and I am a proud Canadian and the two are not mutually exclusive. I'm proud of the advancements that Canada and Canadians have made uh, to, to society here and, and globally as well. Um, Canadians have actively tried to make the world a better place. Uh, at the same time, I also do recognize that we still have areas that we need to make progress in. Uh, I recognize that we need to do a better job uh, speaking up for the underserved and the underrepresented. And, and I hope to do uh, better in those areas uh, because if I can be better, uh, my community will be better. Uh, if my is, is, community is better, then my country will be better. And if my country is better, um, we will leave a better world for the generation tomorrow. Um, so just to end, I, I, I just wanna conclude this your worship by saying that every child matters uh, from the 215 who are simply the tip of the iceberg uh, to the 15 year old who lost her life to hate and the nine year old who lost his family to a despicable act. Um, thank you very much for your indulgence. Thank you for those words, uh, Deputy Mayor. And uh, yeah, it certainly has been some interesting times for sure. Any other uh, council privileges? Um, just a comment in the sense of, I think, uh, I feel very optimistic. I feel very optimistic that we're getting through this COVID-19 issue. Uh, as we all get vaccinated, we're all working on getting our second vaccination happening. And I know there's a little concern around the Delta vi uh, variant, but I think there's a lot of, we're coming into the summer and, and um, there's a lot of things moving forward. I, I, I'm encouraged to see the provincial number is, is, is way down, which is, I think, the best news we've been waiting for. And you know what? We've been in lockdown for the month of April, the month of May, and a good part of June. Um, but you know what? When you see the numbers coming down, has it been worth it? I would say yes, because that's where, you know, to go through all that, you know, and not see something change is, is and so um, I'm encouraged by that. And I think as time goes on, as more and more of us get vaccinated, I think today they said 8% of all Canadians are now double vaccinated. And, you know, we're slowly working on that. And, and so the uptake, and as we hear more and more of the vaccinations or the vaccine is coming to Canada. So it's just a matter of getting everybody through the system. And, and that seems to be the way of getting through it. And um, anyway, I just, I feel optimistic, um, just in the sense of moving forward. But you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, there is, just you can just feel it. You can just sort of see it. And I, I'll tell you a, a sense. Another thing is, um, I can see it. And I've had these comments mentioned to me. Is, as we know, we've all experienced a lot of the parking issues and a lot of the issues that of that. I noticed the last weekend there wasn't the same amount of parking issues. Now, because maybe. Maybe because the stores are opened up now. I, I don't know. Like, I, I just see it. There's something changing. And 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 I, I don't know. And uh, but I will say as, you know, all the all of us who have worked hard to get to where we are. Um, I just say that uh, it, it does seem that it, it's to this point, it's been worth it. We just don't want to see a fourth wave. And I don't even want to say that anymore. But I think uh, we've all worked at getting through this, as we've talked about. And we need to continue to move forward in a cautious approach but it's it it is I, I personally i feel there is a light at the end of the tunnel and we are moving toward a, a better place and uh and uh, i know that uh i think uh in a few weeks i'll get hopefully in a few weeks get, or a few a little bit of time i'll get my second vaccination and probably along with everyone else as well i you know so anyway i just wanted to throw at that that i think it is a we are moving into a more positive place so I don't know if there's any other comments with regards to that, but it's been a long haul. It sure has. And I think Deputy Mayor, I think you asked a question last week um, at County Council. When would we get the opportunity of seeing ourselves in person? And you know, I think basically, depending on how we go, September on is maybe that that time frame. We, you know, it's too early yet to say, but uh, but we still have to do our part, and we have to move forward cautiously. So. 
And thanks to you and staff and all the work, hard work that everybody has done to get to where we are. Okay, so I have an agenda for our in camera camera here. Uh, I need a motion. Can we keep going forward? We, uh, we have one item in our in camera, so hopefully we can keep moving forward um, on the in camera, if that's okay. So can I have a, a, a motion to proceed into closed session, that council proceed into closed session at, and I'll tell you the time once we do that, to discuss a matter related to the following library staff adjustment. Chair of the Grey Highlands Li Public Library Board requests section 239 to be personal matters about identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees and to section 239 2D, labor relations and employee negotiations and, and uh, CIO uh, Karen Govit and Clerk Mar uh, Raylene Martel will remain in attendance. Can I have a mover and a second for that motion? Councillor Nielsen, Councillor Allwood. And uh, it is uh, 5.36, sorry, Madam Clerk. Um, yes, there is one further clause that you didn't read out loud, that library board chair, Kevin Land, be permitted to be in attendance on behalf of the board. Okay, I didn't have that on my, I don't have that on my, uh, the sheet I printed off. So, oh, sorry, Kevin Land. Yeah, it's probably the top of the next page if you printed it out because it was included on the agenda. Oh, yes, you're right. Yes, that library board chair Kevin Land be permitted to be in attendance on behalf of the board. Uh, thank you very much for that, Kurt, Madam Kurt. Okay, uh, so that was moved by Councilor Nielsen, second by Councilor Allwood. All in favor? Okay, that's good. We'll see you on the other link. Just leave this one as it is and we'll move into the um, other, uh, other link.
Okay. So, um, welcome back. And we got everybody. One, two, we haven't got um, one, two, one, two, three, four, five. Councillor Allen is Councillor Allen. I'm not sure if Councillor Allen is there. I haven't, Madam CEO. Okay. Um, welcome back to open session, uh, Council and the public. And we do have a motion that's coming out, and I will ask the clerk to read it, and I will get a mover and a seconder. Uh, thank you, Mayor McQueen. Um, I just had it open. Uh, that a closed meeting was held and only closed session items identified were discussed in closed session, and that council approve an amendment to the Gray Highlands Public Library Board budget for an increase of $20,000 in wages to be offset by overages realized thus far in the 2021 budget, and that the library board find savings in the 2022 budget to offset this increase. Can I have a move? Oh, uh, a move. okay. Now we got Councillor Allen here who still has Claire. Can you stay here? I don't know. I need a mover and a seconder. Um, Councillor Nielsen, Councillor Allwood. Do we have a problem here with the conflict of interest? No, we're not in closed session. He's permitted no. to be here. If he okay. doesn't take part, he's fine. Yeah, okay. That, that is not individuals and it's not being spoken. About. Okay, all in, okay. So moved by Councillor Nielsen, second by Councillor Allwood. All in favor? That is carried. Sorry about that. I just felt a little sorry about that. And and you're you're allowed to be here, Councillor Allen. I was just getting caught up in a long day. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, moving forward, then um, and we have uh, I need a, a mover and a seconder to uh, for the bylaw to confirm the proceedings of Council of the Municipality of Grahams. Moved by Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Little. That the bylaw 2021-061 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of council on June 16, 2021, be read first, second, and third time, and finally passed. And the mayor and the clerk be authorized to sign and seal the same, notwithstanding any contrary provisions of council. Any discussion? All in favor? That is carried. We have our meeting dates set. Is there any discretion discussion on those meeting dates? Councillor Allen. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I see um, in the um, upcoming meetings, Joint Waste and Diversion Site Committee meeting, 18th of June, which is Friday morning. I got a request for a doodle poll earlier today for the same meeting for next week. So I just want clarification, is this meeting still on or not? Hey, Madam, thank you for that, Madam CEO. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, to you, to, <clears throat> to Council. Um, we did receive a request for cancellation from Mayor Mackey today, and uh, that subsequent, subsequently came through from uh, CAO Cinnamon. Uh, so we agreed to cancel it, unfortunately, once again, but uh, we're hoping to set that up as soon as possible. Thanks for raising that, uh, Councillor Allen, and thanks for the explanation, Madam CEO. Is there anything else to do with the, uh, the meetings that are set there? Holy smokes, we're looking at Council in July. Hard to believe we're coming into July. I need one more motion. Deputy Mayor, Councillor Nielsen. All in favor? That's carried. We adjourned at 714. Thanks, everyone. Have a great Good night, evening. everybody. Yep. Thank night. you. Good night. Bye, staff. Bye.